Good evening, everyone. I'm Kate Ford, and at 6.40 p.m., we have concluded closed session and our test session on being in person, and I'm now calling to order this regular meeting of the Santa Barbara Unified School District School Board. And now for information about the interpretation for this meeting. Thank you, Board President Ford. At this moment, I will ask the host to please go ahead and assign our two interpreters so that everybody can see the globe. Our interpreter number one will be Anelix and interpreter number two will be Viviana. So if the host can please assign both interpreters and that way everybody will be able to see the globe and they will be able to select their language. All right, so the interpretation has been activated. And so I will go ahead and give the announcement now. Good evening, everybody. We will have bi-directional simultaneous interpretation in both English and Spanish. If you are not bilingual in English and Spanish, you will have to select your language in order to hear the interpretation. If you are on a laptop or desktop, at the bottom right of your screen, you will see a globe icon that says interpretation. Please click on the globe now and select English. If you are on an iPad or a phone, locate the three dot menu and select language interpretation, then select English and click done. When it's your turn to speak, please remember to be loud and clear. Thank you. And also we are offering American Sign Language for this meeting. If you will be using ASL interpretation, please use the Zoom app on your computer, tablet or phone to join this meeting. If you joined this meeting through your web browser, you may not be able to see the ASL interpreter at all times. And I will now give this announcement in, in, in Spanish. Muy buenas noches. Esta reunión contará con interpretación simultánea bidireccional en inglés y en español. Si usted es bilingüe, no tiene que presionar nada. Si usted no es bilingüe, tendrá que elegir su idioma para escuchar la interpretación. Si está usando una computadora, Verá un icono en la parte inferior de su pantalla a la derecha en forma de globo que dice interpretación. Haga clic ahí ahora y seleccione español. Si está usando su iPad o su teléfono, localice el menú de tres puntos, haga clic en interpretación de idiomas y elija español y aceptar o si está en inglés dice done. Cuando sea su turno de hablar, por favor recuerde hablar con voz fuerte y clara. Gracias. Are there any questions with regards to interpretation? If there are none, then we may go ahead and begin. Thank you. And thank you. So for the benefit of the members of the public who are on Zoom this evening, I want to welcome all of you to the first in-person meeting of the Santa Barbara Unified School Board since the community shut down in mid-March of 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to assure you that we've taken all the same precautions to safely open in person that we have done for our schools. The boardroom has been thoroughly cleaned and disinfected. We're sitting in a socially distanced manner with six feet in between. We're wearing masks, as you can see. The ventilation in the boardroom with windows and doors open is good and has been approved as safe. We have had our temperatures taken and everyone in the boardroom was tested for COVID-19 last Thursday and Friday and all were negative. We are really excited to be with each other in person and we hope you'll be understanding as we try to make this dual effort of in-person and Zoom work smoothly. Also, I want to let you know that Ms. Sims Moten cannot be with us tonight and we send our deep sympathy and our love to her at this time of personal loss. And so now I'd like to ask Superintendent Maldonado to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, President Ford. We will now stand, face the flag. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I also want to mention that at the February 9th, 2021 board meeting, the board did reach a decision in closed session and voted unanimously to extend the agreement with uh, the, our developers on the Tatum property. 
And so with that, I'd like Superintendent Maldonado, please continue with your report. Thank you once again. Good, in good evening, board members, staff, parents, and others joining us tonight. I'm very excited to have us here for our first in-person board meeting of 2021. Today we learned our county's adjusted case rate has declined to 16 per 100,000 residents. And I am happy to recommend that our elementary schools reopen for in-person instruction. There has been a tremendous amount of work done in preparation for this day. And I wanna thank our elementary principals and all the staff involved in planning and preparation. This of course includes our, our food service staff and our maintenance staff who have not stopped working since in-person last March. We also want to acknowledge and thank our elementary teachers and staff and welcome them back to their classrooms. Their work and commitment since day one has been key to supporting and guiding our students during this challenging time. Because our rates were so low, we also gave notice to our secondary teachers today to begin preparation and planning for their eventual return to hybrid in-person instruction. And as you know, many of our parents of secondary students were surveyed in the fall Classes were formed based on some of these selections, but of course, we will still continue to reach out to our parents, conduct webinars of, uh, with information, and ask them to reconfirm their original selections from the fall. More details will be handled by our secondary principals who are also ready, excited to execute the next set of plans. We continue to advocate and support the efforts to get all our school staff and teachers vaccinated. With all of this, I realize that there will still be people without vaccines, people who haven't had equitable access to testing or who feel isolated from their loved ones. We are still in the midst of a pandemic. I hope we continue to behave as if at any point we can still, we can become, still become infected. infected. We, we cannot, cannot let our guard down. We, we must continue to take care of each other, be vigilant, vigilant with our health and safety protocols, protocols and continue to advocate for our school staff to be prioritized for vaccinations. As we move forward, we want to continue to also advocate that schools should always become the first to open and the last to close in our communities. I also want to announce that very soon next, uh, in fact, tomorrow at Franklin Elementary, we will be making available in partnership with County Public Health uh, families and children may be uh, able to come and get tested for COVID. And we will offer the same to families at the La Cumbre or West Side uh, part of our town. And this is in, in um, coordination with public health because we know that there are families who lack access to both the technology and transportation and we wanna keep everyone safe. I wanna thank, thank Dr. Dr. Dorinoso for, for making this available to us so that in partnership we can uh, reach out to those most impacted. In closing, I want to recognize that going back to school in a hybrid model will give us a sense of normalcy. There will be joy and relief mixed with other emotions, like anxiety that can sometimes come during times of change and transition. We are ready to tackle these challenges for the benefit of our amazing students. So thank you and please join me next week in welcoming back our students and staff and teachers. Thank you. And thank you, Superintendent Maldonado. Uh, it truly seems that this world is moving and changing faster than ever before. And I'm so grateful to you and to all of your team for adjusting, for changing, for being flexible and for keeping your focus 100% on our 2020-21 goal of safely returning our students and staff to in-person instruction. And so with that, we will continue with board comments and correspondence. So, Ms. Munoz. Thank you for Okay, uh, thank you, President Ford. I'll do my best to project. Um, and I'd like to just comment on the dedication of our school district staff and the following of the COVID-19 precautions by all every day um, that is happening in our district and we plan to continue to do so and the conversations that will continue in terms of preparing for hybrid instruction, which we know that our students are ready for. Um, we are dedicated to the well-being of all our students, family, school staff, and also the community. The emotional and mental well-being of our students is foremost in our minds 
as we go forward. Thank you. Ms. Caps, please. Thank you, everyone. Um, I believe you can hear me, great. Um, I'm smiling under this mask because we've reached a very critical point. I just have a few thank yous. I wanna first thank the community. The fact that we're at 16 per 100,000 is because of the sacrifices that all of you have made and they've translated into helping our students. So thank you to the community for getting us here. It's been a dramatic progress and we just gotta keep it going. Thank you. Second, I wanna thank County Public Health uh, for agreeing to prioritize teachers starting March 1st in terms of the vaccination and also working with school districts to make sure that those teachers and staff who are actually in the classroom uh, will be receiving the vaccine um, as promptly as possible. And I wanna make sure I said staff because it's not just teachers, it's all school staff that are so valuable and we need them to be as safe and healthy as possible. I wanna thank parents and families and, and for your resiliency, for sticking with this school year. It's been, uh, you can't even describe how hard it's been, but we're at a very critical point of progress here. I wanna thank our students for really showing the way on resiliency. I learned so much about resiliency from children and adaptability and thank you to our students. And uh, finally, thank you to our teachers and school staff. This is a very anxious time for everybody. I think that we should be doing everything we can to thank our teachers. I wish we could have, and staff, I wish we could have a hug your teacher day, hug the school staff day, because uh, really this, this has been a brutal work year. And now um, going back into the classroom um, takes a lot of courage. So I wanted to just leave on that note with the word courage, that's what we're doing. And it's so good to be back here in person. So I'm smiling under my mask. Thank you. Terrific, thank you. And Ms. Alvarez, please. Yes, also a big thank you, of course, to the teachers, to admin, to Superintendent Maldonado for all your work to get us where we are today. And thank you to the community. Please keep wearing your mask. That's what's gonna keep us moving forward. And also a big thank you, of course, to our students. It's going to be a little bit different when you go back to school and make sure you keep wearing your mask because as long as we wear our mask and keep our distance, we can keep moving forward and hopefully pretty soon we can be back at school five days. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, tonight, as we continue with our board meeting and numerous topics where there are diverse opinions in our community. I must ask us all again to remember that this is a meeting of the school board which is held in public. It is not a public meeting and therefore all comments and questions must be directed to the board and not to individuals, not to district employees or to members of the public. I must further remind you that all comments must be guided by respect, civility and tolerance. Name calling is not acceptable and hate speech will not be tolerated. Um, just to clarify, what is hate speech? It is any language that is disparaging, dismissive and full of animosity. It is completely inappropriate here, and I thank you in advance for understanding and respecting this request. And as this is the time to share and respond to a communication, I would like to share that I'm continuing to be so grateful for the involvement of our community and for the correspondence we receive about almost all of the controversial and difficult challenges that we face. On our issues, there are polar um, opposition, uh, opposites of opinion. Uh, and in the past two weeks, I must say that the vast majority of our con correspondence centered on the charter school petition of Thoreau Community School, which we are considering tonight. And since the last board meeting on February 19th, this board member, all the members received 45 letters of support for Thoreau Community School. It was really gratifying to sense the excitement and the passion in many of the letters and it bears um, stating that this support seems to come out of the need and the reminder for education that promotes nature and the environment, social justice and diversity, the family and staff involvement in decision-making, 
personalized instructional innovation and the importance of offering an alternative educational choice for district families. So at this time, we have an opportunity for comments from the public about items, items that are not on the agenda. And um, I want to inform you that because of the number of public comments that are planned for tonight, um, they are limited to two minutes each and they were notified of this earlier this afternoon. Ms. Truillo, do we have any public comments on items that are not on the agenda? Good evening, President Ford. Yes, we do have one public comment on non agenda items. Ms. Sheridan Rosenberg. And um, Ms. Sheridan, can you, Rosenberg, can you Yes, hear yes, okay. can you hear me? Yes, yes thank you, um, good evening. First of all, I would like to address an email that I received this evening. I don't know how many other people received this email, but it asked me to disclose specifically what I intended to talk about in public comment, which I really view as, uh, well, first of all, it was odd and it was surprising, but completely inappropriate. Free speech is a crucial civil right. And I really viewed that as an attempt to bully, intimidate, and definitely interfere with my right to free speech. Now, the last board meeting, even though I didn't like what some of the people spoke about in public comment, throwing around white supremacy and not liking what people say, I can disagree with them, but I will fight to the death to protect their right to say things that might offend me. Just as our my right needs to be protected to be able to speak openly during public comment and for free speech to be, uh, to, to be protected. Hate speech is a very sort of tricky and dangerous road to go down because it's completely subjective. Just because someone says something you don't like doesn't mean that it meets the criteria of, for example, yelling fire in a crowded movie theater or threatening someone. So I strongly encourage you to revisit this policy that you've created where you sort of say, well, you know, be careful about what you say because it, in, it doesn't intimidate me, but it probably intimidates others. And I think you need to walk it back. Thank you. Thank you. And President Ford, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you, Mr. Hio. Now we're on to item D, which is the acceptance of donations for February 23rd, 2021. We're so grateful for the generous donations from individuals and organizations. So board so, members, may I have a motion to accept the donations? I move to accept with gratitude the donation. Thank you so much. And how about a second? And I second. Thanks, Ms. Alvarez. So all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 This motion passes unanimously and again with much gratitude. We're now going on to the consent agenda, try to get uh, perhaps move on through it before our COVID-19 report. Uh, this is where we approve the items that are routine, not likely to require any uh, deep discussion. Um, so first of all, Ms. Trujillo, are there any public comments or on the consent agenda items? Thank you, President Foyes. We have three um, requests to speak on this item. Um, I will name the three. Kim Pascage, Jenny Sperling, and Cressida Silvers. And I will start with Kim Pascay. I am sorry, I'm not seeing Ms. Pascage online, so I will go to Jenny Sperling. And she doesn't appear to be online either. I'm gonna go ahead and go with um, Chrisita Silvers. Ms. Silvers, can you hear us? I can, thank you. Go ahead. Good evening. My child attends San Marcos High School and I am speaking to share my concerns regarding the continued use of armed sheriff's deputies at our school. The school safety plan refers to the quote, positive and regular presence of school resource deputies, probation officers, and other law enforcement. 
I'm curious as to the evidence, if any, that suggests their presence, presence is a positive one for our children. Research around the country finds that, in fact, it increases suspensions and arrests of our children. In the presence of law enforcement, behavioral discipline issues traditionally handled by school staff and administrators are more likely to escalate to the level of criminality, forever changing lives by unnecessarily shuttling our children into the school to prison pipeline. Student engagement, student achievement, and graduation rates are also found to decline in schools with a law enforcement presence. Data show that the students most likely to be targeted are students of color, students with special needs, and low-income students. I hear a lot of comments from parents and school administrators these days about how important equity and mental health are for our, ch our children in reference to online learning. I hope we also consider the equity and mental health consequences of policing our children in school. The San Marcos Safety Plan refers to training all staff in restorative approaches and de-escalation. Thank you for that. But are the sheriff's deputies considered district staff? Are they getting training in restorative approaches and de-escalation? Do these deputies follow a use of force or restraints policy for interacting with our children? Are parents notified when a deputy questions our children? When does that notification occur? Are the deputies aware of which students have IEPs and how to best interact with those students? Is ICE included in the quote other law enforcement clause of these safety plans? If a parent has concerns about a deputy's conduct, should they speak to school administrators or to the sheriff's office? For so many reasons, this just doesn't feel right, especially after the events of this past summer. Please carefully reconsider the deployment of sheriff's deputies in our schools. Thank you. Hello, school board members. My comment today as a parent of a high school student is around the SBUSD safety plans and specifically the district's continued collaboration with the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department at the high schools. The safety plan states that law enforcement will continue to be a positive and regular presence on, cam on campus. It states that school resource deputy probation officers and other law enforcement officers will visit patrol campus regularly. The administration will continue to work closely with our SRD to promote and continue to increase campus and law enforcement collaboration. I have emailed the board our 163 page community report on the impact and ineffectiveness of school resource offices on school campuses. Data collected between 2005 and 2008 across a nationally representative sampling of US public schools found that there was no evidence suggesting that SROs or other sworn law enforcement officers contribute to school safety. SRO placement on, cam on campuses increases the rates of negative youth police interactions and increases the rates of youth referred to the juvenile justice system for nonviolent crimes. The presence of police officers helps to redefine disciplinary situations as criminal justice problems rather than social, psychological, or academic problems, and accordingly increases the likelihood that students are arrested at school. No conclusive data suggests that SROs increase campus safety. SROs simply provide students with an early and an unnecessary introduction to the criminal justice system. Also, as we have seen with the disproportionate rates of sus suspensions and disciplinary actions of students of color in SB Unified, SROs negatively affect and target students of color. Students of color, especially Latinx students, make up half of the student's population and face disciplinary actions at a much higher rate than white peers. The pandemic and online learning give, gives us a chance to step back and look at what time. Thank you. Next, we have Jenny Sperling. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Awesome. Good evening, school board. I'm here today as a community youth worker, but also as a grad student in education from UCSB with deep concern regarding the continued collaboration with the cops in our local schools. In the plan, it reads that the quote, law enforcement will continue to be a positive and regular presence on campus. But I wonder how law enforcement in the past has had a positive presence on any of our campuses. Is this information shareable? From my experience conducting research at a local high school here in town, I witnessed one cop car parked in the high trafficked entrance and exit of the school every day when I arrived on campus in the morning and leaving after school hours. But both times of the day, guess what? There was nobody in the car. 
The presence alone of a cop car incites fear, not safety. And I'm saying this as a, as a white middle-class woman who knows that the origins of American policing were made to protect and keep me safe. Let us not forget that slave patrols and night watches are modern police departments. Research shows that cops make students, particularly black and Latinx students feel, <clears throat> sorry, less safe in schools because of the way they have internalized stigmatization and discrimination. Their mere existence and harmful implementation impact rates of suspension and expulsion and even lead to increasing push out. Board member Alvarez, in the late January board meeting, when the equity resolution passed, you shared one phrase that you and Dr. Sims Moten spoke about when working with when working on the resolution, and it was, quote, achieving equity is when students' identity does not predetermine their success in school. But we know it is proven that students' identities do, in fact, predetermine their safety, their respect, and treatment by SROs in schools. The equity resolution speaks about safe, rigorous, and affirming learning environments. But what is safe? What are student resources? What are student resource officers keeping safe? I suggest we ask who or what SROs think they are keeping students safe from. Thank you. Thank you. And President Ford, that concludes public comment on this item. Oh, thank you so much, Ms. Trujillo. I want to clarify for the public that board members have had an opportunity to consider and ask questions about these items before now, and most of them were also report items in previous board meetings. But before I call for a motion, board members or Superintendent Maldonado, are there any items on the consent agenda that require more information or discussion? Seeing none, I would like to ask for a motion to approve Ah, to approve the consent agenda. Ms. Caps? <laughs> Thank you. And is there a second? I second. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. So all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 The consent agenda passes unanimously. And with that, we will go on to our report our regular report on COVID-19, I believe it's number 16, and I will turn it over to Superintendent Maldonado. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, we will start with our first slide. Uh, next slide, Mr. Rouse. We can check off this last check mark of the things we've been doing to prepare for the opening of school. Continuing to work with public health, all our health, health and safety preparedness has been completed. Facilities capacity, which includes uh, preparing classrooms and elementary uh, school with. I was not muted. I was unmuted. <laughs> Sorry, I'll start again. My apologies uh, to the public. We are still learning to manage this in person meeting. Uh, once again, <laughs> President Ford, yes. thank you everyone for grace and compassion as we do this. Um, the, we continue to work with county public health and we can check that off as we uh, move towards reopening. We have completed all our health and safety preparedness. We continue to finish our facilities capacity, which includes uh, preparing classrooms in elementary schools. I wanna thank maintenance staff for doing that. We have been able to continue to uh, hire more staff and assign them so that we are ready for this elementary opening. And the last item, which we did complete in the last couple of days was um, reaching back out to our families for, for them to give us their choice for both in-person or distance learning. So with that, I'm turning it over to my colleagues and I wanna thank them as well, the executive cabinet who has been working through the holidays to help us get ready. Uh, I'll start with Mr. Tay. Thank you. And we have some exciting news that not only did we have we served 1,776 meals to families who are in quarantine, but we have also reached the 1.1 million meals served um, in our community since March 15. I want to thank our food bank, our partners, Food Bank and UCSB, to also that assists our families. Um, in serving their meals to our families in our community. Dr. Wagner. Okay. All right. Um, uh, good evening, um, Superintendent Maldonado, um, 
Ms. Ford and the board. Um, I am not Susan Klein Rothschild. Um, I'm Fram Wagonick, but I do want to take a quick moment to thank Susan Klein Rothschild for being with us for so many months in our board meetings, educating us so much and being there for us. Um, but I am here to um, present some news from the county. It's good news today. And that is that our adjusted case rate that was 27 the last time we met two weeks ago um, is now 16.9. We actually hit that case rate on um, February 13th. This is great news for Santa Barbara Unified and other districts in our county because it means that we're able to return elementary students to in-person learning um, very soon. And you'll hear more about that tonight. This also means that we are that much closer to achieving the goal of hitting less than seven cases per 100,000 and moving into the red tier. Um, and at that time, when we move into red, which we are hopeful is going to be very soon, we'll be returning our secondary students to in-person learning as well. So at this point, um, I'll turn it over to Ana Escobedo to share with you about elementary return to in-person learning. Thank you so much, Dr. Wagnick and uh, families, board member, superintendent. I'm so excited to be here presenting to you a lot of data, uh, but all this data getting us closer to getting our students, our elementary students back uh, in-person school. Uh, what you see here in front of you, as we had shared with you in our previous board meetings, uh, we had let everybody know that we would be sending out the verification of hybrid program survey to all of our elementary parents. And with over 50% of our parents verifying again, uh, and by the way, that might not sound like a, a high number, but uh, we let them know that if they didn't verify, uh, we would use their previous selection. So we, we, we were confident that that was why they did not respond. Uh, the data shows that 75% of our of parents, of our families uh, remained with their choice of in-person. 3% of our families switched from distance to in-person learning. 6% switched from in-person to distance and 14% remained in distance. So the total we will have, very excited about this, the total we will have uh, of students in person is almost 80% in our elementary, uh, returning to in-person hybrid program. And 20% of our students will continue on with our distance learning, which is familiar uh, to them. 79% um, of our students um, like I have said, 75% of our students uh, will be in-person uh, uh, learning. So again, so close to that 80%, so excited. Uh, we have also been able to honor most of our family's choices, um, and we are excited about that. That also uh, meant that this resulted in uh, quite a bit of reorganization, which we expected uh, for our elementaries. And that included some changes, which we had announced since October, we had been sharing with our families that that could result uh, in changes for our students, changes for our teachers, and also some grade level combinations. Um, but it is our new normal and we are going to make the best of it. Next slide. Like I said, we have a lot of data. We really broke down this data to get a full understanding of uh, who we will be having um, servicing in our schools and who will be servicing, continuing to service in distance learning. So here is the data broken down by individual school site. And as you can see, the majority of our students at Franklin Elementary chose in-person, while at McKinley, we will have more of our students in distance learning overall. It is important to note that between the district level informational meetings and the individual school sites, multiple parent informational meetings, we have had very high number of participants um, joining us in those meetings with close to as of today, and we know that uh, principals are still holding informational meetings, but as of today, close to 1300 participants in elementary. That is 
quite significant and all the props to our school sites for working so hard with that. Next slide. So again, just breaking down the data some more. Here you see the breakdown of data uh, by language fluency. So what, what our parents um, and our, our guardians chose in, in this group of students. So 80% of our English learners and our English only students will return in person with 73% of our initially fluent English proficient students returning in person and 78% of our redesignated students returning in person. So that was by language fluency. If we break down the data a little bit more by race and ethnicity, we can see that 58% of our American Indian students have chosen in person, 89% of our Asian students have chosen in person, 94% of our Black or African American students will be coming back in person, 80% of our Latinx students in person, 67% of our native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander students also returning in person and 86% of our white student population will be coming back in person. We hope that gives us all an idea of what we will be seeing and uh, who we will be seeing in school and who we will be continuing to support in distance learning next week. Um, either way, we are excited, we miss them all and we can't wait to see them. And now I will hand it back to Dr. Wagenick. Thank you. So uh, board, school districts are not allowed to reopen uh, grades seven through 12 when the county is in the purple tier. Uh, but once the county is in the red tier, as I mentioned earlier, um, Santa Barbara Public Health and, and California Department of Public uh, Health will give us the go ahead to open school for our secondary students. And as soon as that happens, we'll be asking you to allow our nine secondary schools to return to in-person learning in hybrid. Now, in terms of facilities and safety considerations, we are ready. Uh, the secondary principals are leading their schools right now through the operational processes required to begin in-person learning. Um, this week, Families will receive a parent square, asking them to confirm their program selection, either to return in person or remain in distance learning. Uh, next week, the principals will work to place students in their cohorts, either A, B, in person or C, distance learning cohorts. And in addition, this afternoon, um, secondary certificated educators received their 10 day notice to return to work in person. And beginning March 9th, all secondary staff will be working five days a week from campus. The exception to this, of course, is those who've been granted workplace accommodations. Um, finally, families will soon be receiving information regarding the return to in-person learning from their principals and holding those, uh, they'll be holding those informational sessions similar to um, what elementary has done over the last uh, few weeks. And then our final, final update from secondary relates to changes in the world of athletics. On Friday, February 19th, the California Department of Public Health released new guidance for youth sports. Sports uh, that had previously not been allowed to practice or compete in purple now are allowed to begin once the county adjusted case rate drops below 14 per 100,000. Um, and of course we believe that um, perhaps we've already reached that uh, threshold, but we anticipate that by sometime next week, um, if, if trends remain the same, that we will have reached that uh, case rate. So the biggest impact on our high school sports is the notification that high contact outdoor sports that previously had only been allowed to compete in the orange tier will now be permitted to compete under the following conditions. The first condition is informed consent. Parents and guardians must consent to their child competing under reduced safety measures. Next, testing. Student athletes and coaches um, in these sports must be tested weekly. And if competing or having a competition in that week, that test result 
must be provided within 24 hours of the game or match. So we will be testing our student athletes and coaches in order to allow these sports to practice and compete as soon as the adjusted case rate in our county drops below 14 cases per 100,000. We're hopeful that our county uh, again will reach um, that point this week and become official next Tuesday when the county releases its weekly numbers. Uh, in closing, the sports impacted, those high, um, high contact outdoor sports are soccer, football, and water polo. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'd like to share with you um, our district data as of 4 p.m. on yesterday, Monday, February 19th. Wrong date, what was yesterday? The 22nd, 4 p.m. Monday, February 22nd. Um, our, our peak week as a district in terms of cases uh, on campus occurred five weeks ago. And uh, thankfully since then we've seen a decline in cases um, since then. So as a reminder, the total number of cases includes positive cases for students and staff who are working in person or participating in small cohorts or athletics. Um, whether or not those individuals were actually on campus while they uh, were positive for COVID. So we've been very transparent about um, accounting for all of the cases of individuals who are working or participating in our programs on campus. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Becchio to talk about um, staff COVID testing. All right. Well, thank you and good evening, board members. I wanted to bring you a quick update on uh, staff COVID testing. Uh, we have actually carried out a couple different methods of testing. We have adapted this round of testing to be on-site testing simply because we now have teachers on site. So this week we have elementary teachers on site and we have deployed a method of testing through Valencia Labs where each site has a testing coordinator and those teachers can get their COVID test at their school site. We tested about 250 employees today. Uh, this, um, you all got the test and saw how easy it went and, and how easy it was to retrieve your result, results and how quick it was. Uh, the turnaround time was very quick. So we will be um, continuing, continuing that process, process of testing on site. On site. We, will we will test, test secondary, secondary staff the week of March 8th. And, and we will then have, then a, system have a system of testing staff, staff every, every two weeks, weeks um, as, we um, as we get back students into back into school. And, and that, that, with that, that with that, that brings you up to date on our staff, staff COVID testing. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Wagenack to talk to you about student testing. All right, so um, seeing the importance of adding as many layers of Swiss cheese to our mitigation efforts, we've decided to add voluntary student testing to our safety measures. In scenario one that you see here, uh, when a student displays COVID symptoms at school, they are to be taken to an isolation room and their family is contacted. So what we'll be doing is that when that family is contacted, the school will offer to conduct a test while um, they are waiting for someone to come and pick up the student. In scenario two, when a student is at home ill because of COVID symptoms or they're in close contact, the family can contact the school and request a test. In that case, um, a parent or guardian will come to the school, pick up a test, then return the test to the school when it is completed. And then finally, um, if a parent or guardian can demonstrate a valid reason for needing a test, when their child is asymptomatic, a test will be provided for them to administer at home and return to the school. Um, the cost of testing students is, um, there'll be no cost for students who qualify for Medi-Cal. And the cost is $55 per test 
for students who do not qualify for Medicare. And with that, um, are you presenting the next one? Okay. Um, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Ms. Escobedo. Thank you, Dr. Wagnick. So just a little more details we know, we, you know, we shared about the data, safety, um, and now we'd like to just remind you of what the instructional uh, program will look like when our students return um, or start the hybrid models, whether they return in person or they continue in distance learning. And so what this is something, what you're seeing now, uh, we've actually shared with you before. So if it looks familiar, it should. And this, this particular slide is highlighting the in-person hybrid models with the group A and group B. Uh, as a reminder, the group A students in person will be uh, going to school on Mondays and Thursdays. The group B will be going to school on Tuesdays and Fridays, both groups A and B will be online or distance at home distance learning on Wednesday for half the day. And what it will look like for, for them when they are in person for their in-person day, um, they will start the day, uh, the teacher will have uh, at the very beginning of the day, a, a check-in, a social, really focused on social emotional and really uh, getting those students uh, that are not in person kind of start it for the day, get them on track for their schedule. And so that will be a whole class check-in that the teacher uh, starts the day off. Uh, so the students that are in person will be hearing the teacher's directions and also the students that are at home. Um, the rest of the day while they are in person, obviously there will be, uh, there. It will look and, and feel like a regular school day pre-COVID. Um, so their schedule, uh, as far as the day, will be very similar. There will, there will be staggered arrival times, but as far as the start of the day and the end of the day, it will be very similar to what it was pre-pandemic. Pre uh, when they are in person, also, obviously, social distance, uh, six feet apart, seating arrangements, masks, and many, many, many hand washing opportunities and uh, protocols. Um, and like I said, staggered arrivals and dismissals to avoid big congregations. Um, and uh, as I had stated, they will be following very closely uh, the regular school day as it was before. What's happening with the students that are at home? Again, they will be checking in whole class in the morning, and then they will have their two days uh, that will be supported with both synchronous and asynchronous work. Um, and so we've gotten to know those, those terms, but just as a reminder, uh, synchronous means that they will be with uh, either a special uh, a teacher, either the art teacher or uh, maybe an intervention teacher, or a literacy coach, just depending on the school site that will help them um, in that distance learning or provide them some instructional support um, and or maybe a paraprofessional for a small group, um, many different varieties, but they will be doing this from home. Um, and uh, so it will look similar to what uh, they have been doing now uh, with the difference that in the morning they will get their day started and their schedule reminder uh, from their teacher um, all together, which we think will make a big difference for our students, especially our youngest students. Um, then what is happening with our group C? Uh, these are the students that have chosen the distance learning all five days. That is going to be the most similar to what we ha have been uh, seeing or been in for the last almost year, where all five days they have, it's not the same teacher from the students in the AB group. It will, they have a, 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 a different teacher assigned just to them and it will follow the distance learning schedules and blocks that we have uh, been following so far. Um, they will um, also, uh, Again, just they, there will be some opportunity possibly um, if there are extracurricular activities uh, at the school that they might be able to participate in, but that is all gonna be dependent on what the schools offer. Okay, next slide. 
And on our next slide, uh, since I kind of went into detail what uh, that in-person day uh, looks like, I wanted to share with you uh, in detail what that instructional, uh, what those instructional blocks look like for the distance learning. And again, we know you're familiar with it because uh, the students have been um, um, experiencing that for the last few months. Uh, but just as a visual, it gives you a breakdown of what their learning blocks will be broken down. This example very specifically is for TK and K. And remembering that those learning blocks can either be synchronous, meaning with a teacher online or some support staff, or asynchronous, meaning that they get some time to work independently, and then the teacher or whomever is in charge of, of, of that particular block would be checking in with them, and they have work to complete. Next slide. This last one is just an overall big picture, uh, another way of looking at all three models for hybrid um, instructional learning uh, for when we come back um, to in-person and or continue in distance learning. And this just gives you the week view so that you can see where group A is and what group B is doing on Monday, Tuesday, what both groups are doing on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And as for us, that concludes our COVID report. And I believe I will be handing it back to Superintendent Maldonado. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Escobedo, uh, Board President Ford. That concludes the report. And again, when we get to our action item, I am recommending that we open on Monday, March 1st in a staggered schedule. Thank you so much. Ms. Trujillo, is there any public comment on this report item? Thank you, President Ford. Yes, we have one request to speak and it's Ms. Karen McBride. Ms. McBride, can you hear us? One moment. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Hi. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, uh, good evening, uh, President Ford and the members of the school board. Um, tonight, I want to continue to communicate to you about the real concerns and challenges that come to me from SBTA members who can't speak on, on their own behalf uh, tonight. But um, I just want to start by, by saying that we hear references in the media, in conversations and comments on social media about the union. And, and if you could see me, I'm using air quotes around the union. But I want to emphasize that the union is not a nebulous entity, but a, a collection of the real people who are taking to heart the well being and growth of the children of our community. They could be your child's kindergarten teacher, your son or daughter's counselor or coach. They could be the school nurses that are greeting you at the school entrance. And so many more people who are working hard every day, whether they're remote or in their classrooms. Um, so many of the elementary teachers are gonna be teaching multi-grade level classes, as you know, and some of them will be teaching three grade levels, um, which is going to be particularly challenging from this Friday to next Monday. And as of today, there are some who have not yet received for firm teaching assignments or class rosters. So there's still change taking place that can make the preparation for those classes very difficult. One such example um, that a teacher shared with me, and I think this would be true all across the elementary classes because it involves Lucy Calkins, is it's the challenge of preparing the personalized baskets of reading materials for each child in her class. Um, they have to prepare these baskets that have uh, books that are specific to each child based on their reading levels. So um, keep in mind that we're talking about classes full of children they don't know yet. So they, they need to track down their, their lexile levels, et cetera, while simultaneously still teaching the children that are in their classes right now. Uh, another teacher reported to me that she will have a class with six students she knows and the remaining 18 students that she has not yet met. Am I, should I stop or can I continue? It's time. Okay. All right. Well, you can tell that I there are lots of concerns and I, I appreciate your service and the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. And President Ford, that concludes public comment on this item. 
Thank you, Ms. Trujillo. Um, so with that, I just would like to remind uh, all of you what Superintendent Maldonado said, which is that later in this meeting, it will be an agenda action item. But for now, perhaps there are board members who have specific questions that they would like to direct to the executive cabinet. Ms. Alvarez. Yes, thank you. A uh, couple of questions, or I'm gonna ask for reminders. Would you remind us, the has ma have masks been distributed to all the teachers or will are those coming? How will the teachers make sure that they have their personal protective equipment? And also what about students? Are we, have we, how are we going to distribute those masks for students? And also, am I correct that hand washing times have been scheduled during the school day for students? Okay. Um, hold on, I'm trying to get my... I can um, talk to, to the point about the masks. All masks have been delivered. There are multiple masks for students and employees. Each employee has a face shield also, and so do the students have a face shield. Sorry, I need to unmute myself, I just remembered. Um, Dr. Wagonet, you mentioned that uh, there's an option for students to be tested. Is there a cost to the parents for this test? You mentioned that if they're Medi-Cal, there's no cost and there's a $55 fee. Will the parents have to pay that fee? Okay, I'll, I'll cover, I think there are three okay. remaining questions. So there was a question about the um, map or the mask being provided to students. So the mask and the hand washing, those are, um, sorry, I had to show my face. Um, those have been, as Ms. Jose stated, delivered to the school. So the principals will be coordinating that um, as well as, yes, there are hand washing schedules um, that each school is following and they've submitted those. Um, most of them are actually in their site COVID plans. And then there, we, uh, no cost to the families uh, for testing. We really do see this as, as I said, another slice of the Swiss cheese, um, and it will be beneficial to the district as a whole to provide testing. Thank you. I have no other questions. Ms. Caps. Uh, a couple questions on, uh, well, one just on elementary, um, Ms. Escobedo. Uh, is there a date? Well, first of all, I just want to acknowledge the scheduling challenges of, of all of this and principals and teachers. Do, um, and I I hear from Ms. McBride that, that some teachers haven't yet, that hasn't been all settled yet. And I certainly hope that happens soon. Has there been a target date for when students will find out who their teachers are district-wide? And I apologize if I missed that. Thank you for that uh, question, Superintendent Caps. Uh, yes, so um, in the order of operations, um, we wanted to make sure that we, um, you know, everything's a waiting game. We have to wait for the numbers, the updates, which we heard today, um, but also in consultation with with the board, which is which is why we are here today presenting. So, um, waiting on that. Once that is confirmed, the students, the parents did receive last Friday, as did the teachers, uh, their ass assignments. For the students, what program they selected, A or B. A name of the teacher was not given until we had confirmed that we are returning, and more importantly, when, right? We, we needed to know when. And so um, if you uh, agree and 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 we are moving along with the March 1st um, uh, recommended return date, then students will be receiving their final notifications with their teacher assignments tomorrow. Those are set to go out tomorrow. Um, so yes, I, I, you didn't miss it. We, we were just waiting, we're waiting for today. Thank you. This is a question for both secondary and elementary. I've gotten this from a few different parents about um, 
the well first of all i i downloaded my ipass and i'm ready to go but and it's very clear but one question i think is tripping people up a little bit about the travel so would you mind speaking to the travel i think that would probably be you dr wagnick and that's yes. regulation um yes thank you we actually are going to be putting messaging out um, regarding the um, definition of gathering and gathering and travel so um that language comes from public health, both um, California Department of Public Health and our local public health. So in terms of travel, um, it is recommended that if you travel more than 120 miles from your home, um, it's not required, this is a guideline, but that you would quarantine. But again, it's not required. Um, people have to make their own decisions and they know what they have and had not done. So we're actually asking families to, um, to think through the safety of their practices. Um, and then the other question is about gatherings and what does a gathering constitute? And a lot of the questions around gathering have had to do with, well, what about youth sports or going to church? Those are okay because they're allowed by public health. So anything that public health allows in the way of gatherings is doesn't fall under that um, that question. It's more a gathering would be: Have you gone to a barbecue and been around groups of people who you either do or do not know? So um, we're going to send that messaging out and try to make it much clearer for families. And we appreciate their vigilance with wanting, you know, to do the right thing and answer correctly. I would say you drive up to Paso Robles with your family in your, you know, your pod for the day. I think that's roughly 130 miles. Right. That doesn't necessarily, you have to use your, just use your judgment. That's a much different than getting on airplane and and, 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 and visiting relatives that you haven't seen in a long time. Exactly. And that's why we say only, when I say only they know, right? They know what they did, and so, you know, if you're if you're doing basically the same thing that you'd be doing, if you were here in Santa Barbara, okay, that's much different than being around large groups of people, um, et cetera. Thank you for that clarification. So, bottom line, it's use your best judgment as we've been doing with this pandemic. So, thank you. Um, let's see. I had a question about. I know that we're all focused right now on. Uh, this March 1st decision and vote, but there was pretty dramatic news today with secondary uh, yeah. coming in around noon um, from, I believe down from the governor's office that we're hit that 16 uh, per 100,000. So I recognize this is breaking news, but is, and you spoke to this some already, but I'd love to hear um, any plans for more information for parents, even if they're tentative, like the, uh, Q and A session that happened the night after our board meeting, when it was more apparent that elementary could open soon. I just think that this was uh, pretty dramatic news for not just families, but also for teachers and staff. So any anything that you can unpack and elaborate on, I think would be helpful. Uh, understanding that you don't want to say the wrong thing, uh, and this was this was quite dramatic news to get from the state that we fell to 16. We were up at. I think we were at 42 even just two weeks ago. Is that correct? We were at 27. 27 two weeks ago. Okay, so the secondary, if you could just speak to secondary, please. Yeah, Ms. Carey. Thank you, Ms. Carey. Sure. Uh, good evening, board and Superintendent Maldonado. And thank you for the question, board member Caps. Um, even though it was uh, exciting and sudden and welcome news today, um, it's we it, it's news that we knew we would be receiving at some point. And so we've been preparing for the moment that we experienced today for some time, knowing that um, very immediately families would want to know what that means, what the implications are for, for our planning, for their planning. And I just want to reemphasize what Dr. Wagner said earlier, which is that in terms of safety and facilities, we are ready, we have been ready, and we are eager. There are some internal operational processes that very much parallel what everyone has learned about the, the stages of preparation for elementary um, when it comes to verifying pr family program selection and balancing cohorts and communicating those steps. Um, but we are prepared to execute on those this week, 
uh, and next week. And even as we speak, the principals uh, are preparing and are poised to push out communication to their respective school communities about multiple opportunities to get more information about the ways we will be moving forward as a system and then how that is experienced at the level of the individual school site. So for example, all of our principals will be pushing communication out this week to their, to their secondary school communities in advance of uh, uh, closing the, the program selection uh, window. And then there will be future uh, informational meetings in the form of webinars, principal chats, parent square messaging uh, throughout next week, and even ongoing, as Ms. Escobedo said, even as we get you know, imminently close to the initiation of in-person learning, um, we, we plan for um, multiple days uh, for, for the informational campaign. So beginning this week, continuing through next week and continuing beyond that as needed to ensure that families have multiple avenues for understanding uh, the status of, of things as they continue to develop and for being able to get any questions answered or things clarified that, that may be what they need. Okay, and just to be really specific, do you have, you, do you have a target date in mind for that Q&A session? Uh, so it won't be one district-wide session. We've got 9,000 got families in secondary. <laughs> so what we're using is an approach um, that is uh, decentralized at the level of school site, but very much calibrated. We're, we're meeting daily Makes sense. Um, and we're making sure that our messaging is clear and consistent across our school sites, which do vary. I mean, we have alternative education, we have large schools, we have smaller schools. So we're making sure that that information is well calibrated, but it is being handled by our secondary principals. Thank you, Ms. Carey. Mm -hmm. Ms. Escobedo, I apologize. I had one more question related to timing. Um, uh, bus schedules, All that are those also waiting upon this action tonight? Probably. <laughs> there you go. So <laughs> do those soon. Yes, uh, great question. And, and I didn't include it in this board uh, update, but um, I somehow remember that it has been spread up before. But of course, because we were pending actual dates, uh, the great news is, uh, and I'll, I'll just uh, speak for Ms. Jate right now, uh, she, we've been working together since October uh, in planning this and, and the timing of it and making sure uh, that we are identifying all of the students who have previously been used transportation to make sure that uh, they are still going to be receiving that and there's no surprise uh, surprises. But um, to answer your question, waiting for today, tomorrow, uh, we will be sending out those notices uh, to the parents uh, for those students who have in the past received transportation services, um, the notifications. Actually, this time we'll be asking the parents if they still are uh, wanting or interested in the transportation with um, also families who maybe are new to us having an opportunity to go to the school sites to request the transportation at those school sites who do receive, not all our schools receive busing, but at the schools that do offer the busing uh, service. So um, as of tomorrow, those letters should be going uh, out, uh, asking the parents to confirm. And if yes, as of Monday, March 1st, uh, the services will begin. In that letter, it will be describing uh, the proto safety protocols, which I know Ms. Jate has already shared with the board in the past, but reminding the parents of all of those uh, safety precautions that um, are going to be expected to be followed uh, for all of our students uh, to keep them safe. Anything else, Ms. Jate? Okay. Thank you. Obviously, we all know that uh, access to transportation is so incredibly vital. Thank you for that. Okay, I just uh, just two quick comments. Thanks for answering my questions and of all, all the logistics. But uh, to Ms. Ms. Bride, I would love to, she didn't finish her comments. I'd love to, if you could email them uh, to the board and, and relevant staff to hear the remainder of teacher concerns, that would be great. And also to the public, uh, I believe, and I know it's shared here that um, summer school is going to be incredibly important this year uh, in terms of learning loss. And I, we have a, a, this is an agenda item later on for anyone in the public who wants to hang on to listen about summer school uh, that's coming later. It's something I'm keenly watching, especially coming from the Biden administration, their emphasis and their hopeful massive funding for summer school support. 
So thanks, stay tuned for that. Thank you, President Ford, and thank you to the team. Thank you so much. Ms. Munoz, please. Yes, I appreciate the comments and questions of my sister board members. Um, as, 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 as is evident, you know, we are concerned about the students and wanting to have them go back to school safely. Um, and one of my questions that I've had with parent groups is, you know, if they choose to keep their children in distance learning, of course, you know, would they be able to then change to hybrid at some point? Um, I understand, I know we had talked before about possibly like a wait list, depending on the school. Um, I guess it, uh, in elementary, I guess at this time. <laughs> Thank you so much for that question, uh, board member Munoz. Yes, um, we have shared with you in the past that it will be based on, as you can see, and as we shared, um, there has been a lot of reorganization that has happened in order to be able to provide the parents with the choices that they needed for their families. As a result of that, we are um, in order, if a parent at any time wants to go from in-person to distance learning, we will accommodate that whether for whatever reason. Going backwards from distance to in-person, will be based on availability because of the safety precautions that we have to follow and the very limited and challenging uh, spacing uh, configurations that we are finding ourselves in. We clearly know it is not ideal to have multi-grades. We, we know this, uh, we, we're making it work because in some situations, some, some research shows that it can work. Uh, but again, it's 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 the spacing and our limitations because of of safety uh, that would prevent us from doing that. So it will be case by case, school by school, class by class. And we we believe there will be some movement, so that might afford some opportunity. But that will strictly be a a school based uh, decision that the principal would have to uh, determine at that point. I'd like to add something to uh, to your uh, question earlier, uh, board member Caps. We also are going to allow for some compensation to our teachers. We know how much it's going to take. It's such a huge lift, and so we've agreed to compensate them an extra two days of pay uh, in lieu of our of their preparation because we know that it's it's a big change. Normally, in normal times, non-pandemic times we would be able to give them two days of substitute time. So that's the, the compromise we've reached. We're also allowing for $300 of instructional materials that they can find, that they can purchase at their discretion to also help them implement this hybrid learning model. So we understand that uh, for some teachers, they're still in that last you know, minute, last haul to get the classes started, but we are we are sensitive to that need and are looking for other ways to compensate them in light of COVID and the restrictions that we have with providing two days of substitute time. And so, oh, is that okay if I continue? Please. Um, also, um, and then so at this time, I just want to make sure that I understand since I do get um, asked about this. And so with secondary school, they can still indicate if they want to, you know, are willing to have their children into hybrid learning. Is that correct? Uh, thank you, board member Munoz. Yes. So that process will be happening for secondary this week where families have the option to confirm the program selection they made in November or indicate a change to that, that program preference. Well, certainly, you know, as, as, um, you're stating because of the class organization and such, it's better to go ahead if you're thinking leaning towards hybrid to go ahead and and select that if the parents wish to do that. Um, and also, you know, as as um, board member Caps mentioned, also, you know, we are looking at summer too, so that all of our students will be able to, you know, continue their learning um, and preparing for that. So I look forward to that agenda item also. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, it's on the schedule, uh, obviously, that there will be lunch, but I wonder if you could give us a picture of what lunch looks like at an elementary school. 
now, <laughs> next week? Great question, Board President um, Ford. Um, it will look a little different, uh, which is why um, we are also proposing a staggered uh, return um, so that especially our, our young babies, our, our littles, uh, can get situated uh, with their new procedures. And so uh, just like in the classroom, uh, you know, they, they, they will still use the lunch areas. Um, for most of our school sites, this means multiple lunch schedules <laughs> and multiple recess schedules just to ensure the safety, the distance and the supervision, uh, the, the appropriate supervision for, uh, for the spacing uh, needs. Uh, so they, they will be eating out outdoors. They will be making use of uh, the traditional lunch pavilions that they have in the past and um, additional or surrounding um, open areas for that um, so that they can try to not have a recess and lunch schedules going most of the day. Uh, but again, for some school sites, this is a little bit easier than other school sites uh, based on their um, their physical accommodations. Thanks. And do all students stay for that afternoon student support session? The afternoon student support session. Isn't it on the schedule? Um, so uh, maybe what's in the afternoon after lunch for elementary? For elementary in person? Yes. In person, it will be like their regular school day. So uh, whatever uh, academic subjects that they will be covering um, will continue in person at the end. Maybe uh, you're, th you th you're thinking of the distance learning. Yes. Um, the distance learning block um, after lunch on Wednesdays um, will be asynchronous. So that will be because Wednesday will be, an, uh, I think that's what we're, we're talking about is um, the Wednesday is a shortened day. I'm right. not sure if I mentioned that. Uh, and so because Wednesday is a shortened day, everybody uh, will be at distance learning. Uh, the distance learning in the morning will be with their teacher or a special, uh, you know, special teacher, art teacher or support staff um, in the afternoon, because we have to make sure we meet our instructional minutes, uh, they will have uh, asynchronous work or support uh, from uh, classified staff, kind of like what they're getting in the learning center in the small cohorts right now. So that's what will be happening on the shortened days on Wednesday, um, after they get out. Great. Mm -hmm. So on Wednesday, we'll go back to sort of a distance learning distribution of lunch. So we will continue as far as lunch goes, we will continue our grab and go lunches on Wednesdays. Actually, every day, every day, every day, but so, it's just grab and leave on Wednesdays. So for the students <laughs> who are so the students that are in person will be scrap, eat and continue learning in person. For the students who are at home, they can still come, even if they're not right, right, in right. person, to grab and go. <laughs> Great. But on Wednesday, nobody's actually in the, the students are not there. Correct. Except for when they come to grab and go. Correct. That perfect. is correct. Uh, I, I think the, uh, that I don't have any other questions. The other members of the board were so well prepared. I do just want to say that this isn't the end, this is only the beginning. And so I hope that all of us stay really uh, in tune with the needs, the anxiety, uh, and, the, and also the successes and the triumphs of these early days of returning to elementary in hopes that we do vote that way later in this meeting. And also I just wanna to say to the parents and members of the community that are out there, uh, this is not the end, this is the beginning. So please stay in touch with us and please let us know those things that are going well and let us know the things that we still um, have, have to work on or things you have questions on. So stay in close touch with us. And with that, I think we will now uh, move forward to, uh, let's see, where were we? Back action item. I believe, uh, no, we've got, skip what? Do you wanna keep some learning report? No, 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 we have to go back to the action items, way back. Let's go to the public hearing. 
Uh, so we have a public hearing at this time. I'm going to call um, the start of the public hearing on the sun shining of the CSEA proposal for successor contract negotiations with SBUSD. Dr. Becchio, do you have any comments? I do. Thank you. I just wanted to introduce once again that I'm bringing this for public hearing. Uh, we are finishing our contract with CSEA. Three-year contract is up in June. We're negoti negotiating our successor contract. And these are the um, articles that CSEA intends to bargain. And this is an opportunity for public uh, input on this item prior to board action. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I will ask Mr. Trujillo, are there any public comments on this hearing? President, for there's no comments on this item. Then I call this hearing closed. And with that, we move on to the action item for tonight. And G1 is the Thoreau Community School petition for the establishment of a charter in the Santa Barbara Unified School District. To introduce this item, I'd like to call on Ms. Chate and her team to review the recommendation of the district regarding the charter petition for Thoreau Community School. Thoreau founders will also have an opportunity to present a response to the district, after which we'll listen to public comments on this item. I want to clarify that the board has three options for this item. There could be a motion to approve the charter petition of Thoreau Community School or a motion to accept the findings of the district and reject the Thoreau <clears throat> excuse me, petition, or a third option uh, of a motion to approve the petition of Thoreau Community School with conditions. So with that, I will turn it over to your team, Ms. Chate. Thank you, Board President Ford. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Maldonado. Our team would like to present our findings of the Thoreau Community School Charter with you. Next slide, please. As you are aware, we currently have three charters who offer educational choices through our district. And with all three of these charters, we have a very strong relationship with them. Next slide, please. This is the timeline. Uh, Thoreau Community School submitted on October 30th. Tonight, the board will take action on this charter on February 23rd. Next slide. This is our team that re uh, reviewed the spe specific areas of expertise of this charter. There's uh, seven of us. Next slide, please. So if base for denial, the board may deny a charter if it makes one or more specific findings. In this case, we have three, which we will be discussing in this petition, in this presentation. The four areas that form the basis for these findings are budget, educational program, governance, and employee qualifications. The budget on the next slide um, is something that I performed and I wanna talk about a specific area and that is um, the special ed area um, for the financial part of it. The Thoreau Community School missed the SELPA um, notification to join their SELPA. So they did not make this deadline. So they become a part of our special education team which comes along with a contribution or a payment towards our contribution, the district's total contribution, which is uh, determined by the total contribution divided by the district and all the charters, ADA, the charters who are in our special education um, um, program, which equals about $1,700 per student. Then we times it by the number of ch charter kids for Thoreau Community School, which that equals to about $165,000, which is not accounted for in the school in this um, budget. If the charter continues with this program, the cost in, with our program, the cost increases substantially 
because of the projection of the ADA. Each year, their ADA grows, and so will their contribution. This affects their ending fund balance. If you look at, if you compare either their um, an, an, an analysis, excuse me, analysis of uh, their chart, their budget, and my analysis, they both end up with a negative or a deficit spending for year one. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ana Escobedo, Assistant Superintendent of Elementary. Thank you, Mr. Tay. Next slide, please. So our part of our team, uh, which included uh, several members of the elementary ed services team, um, after carefully reading the entire uh, petitioner's proposal, uh, we came up with a number of significant concerns uh, with the proposed uh, educational program in different areas, including specifically in their plans for English learners and students with disabilities. Um, as marked insufficient, these were the areas that, um, that were included, uh, students to be served, uh, curriculum and instructional design, plan for students that are academically low, low achieving, plan for English learners, plan for special education, and measurable student outcomes. And, and, and if we ask ourselves why, in, in general, um, while we looked over and repeatedly reviewed the information that uh, they provided, the petitioner was able to provide a lot of theoretical pedagogy and methodology. However, it was left unclear in these areas that have been mentioned that how, the how, uh, they were going to transfer this theory into practice, and more importantly, how to transfer that practice into outcomes specifically for the targeted student groups that they have identified. And that was mainly the biggest reasons why in these areas they were marked insufficient. So with that, to talk a little bit more about those particular two areas for English learners and students with disabilities, I will hand it over to our partner, Maria Larios Horton. Thank you, Ms. Escobedo. Good evening, President Ford, board members, and Superint Superintendent Maldonado. Um, after careful review, as mentioned by Ms. Escobedo, it was determined that Thoreau Community School's plan for serving English learners and students with disabilities, as presented, was unsound and unlikely to yield successful implementation of the proposed educational program and it ultimately failed to provide a reasonably comprehensive description of the educational program. And with that, I turn it back over to Ms. Jete. This is on governance. It is important for the charter schools as part of their governance to understand and affirm compliance with conf conflict of interest laws. However, the charter does not provide a clear affirmation of the importance of the conflict of interest law, which is government code 1090. Nor have they produced two important documents relating to conflict of interest. They are the conflict of interest policy and the conflict, conflict of interest code. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Becchio. Thank you very much, uh, board members. I'm uh, going to speak to you on employee qualifications and the qualification of employees is important because as stated in the, in the proposal, uh, the, these employees will provide the leadership and support in implementing the educational vision, the philosophy, goals, objectives of the charter. Uh, there were two remaining issues around employee qualifications. One is under the directors of operations, um, there are minimum qualifications listed, they are subjective in nature. And that was the main problem. The actual objective qualifications have a statement that outlines that these may be considered in the hiring process. So uh, really it should be the objective qualifications that are required. 
that was one problem. The other is um, the petition actually uh, lists special subjects teachers, and it talks about how multiple subject teachers will teach the special classes such as art, music, PE, science, but that they will transition to a teacher who will not actually hold a credential in the area to do the specialized. So for example, music teacher, but they do not outline that teacher having a music credential. So those were the two main um, issues around employee qualifications that I wanted to present to you. With that, I will turn it over to the next presenter. Is that Ms. Jute? Even after consideration, considering the responses, the staff team recommends that the district board deny the TCS charter based on the following findings. The charter school has presented an unsound educational program for pupils to be enrolled in the charter school. The petitioners have demonstrably unlikely to successfully implement the program set forth in the petition. And the petition does not contain reasonably comprehensive description of all 15 of the required charter school elements. As a reminder to the board that they can deny a charter with one or more findings, and we have three. That ends the staff's presentation, President Ford. Thank you so much. So with that, um, we will now continue with the presentation of the response by the Thoreau team. And Sandra Trujillo, will you be calling on someone to lead us through this? I believe uh, Ms. Marianne Demedio Caston should uh, be presenting this. Yes, I'm, I'm ready to present. I thought that there would be public comment before our, our chance to speak, but I'm ready to go. There will be public comment after. Okay, fine. I just, um, good evening, Superintendent Maldonado and school board members. I'm Mary Antimedio Caston, president of the Board of Trust of Thoreau Community School. Next slide, please. I started working on this school when I was in sixth grade. I sat in my seat, pinned to the floor, using Montessori's metaphor, like a butterfly pinned to the wall. It was hot. I looked at the clock. How much longer before we get out? Why was school so incredibly confining? Why did I have so much more of myself engaged when I was outside doing things? Why were my Girl Scout badges better evidence of my knowledge and skills than my usually good grades? Why was school so stifling? By the time I graduated high school, I'd heard about Summerhill, the progressive school in England, where kids only went to class if they wanted to be there. And they had school meetings where their voices counted and how the rules were made. What a concept, student voice, student initiative, self-determined learning. Could school really be like that? I've spent my life career studying how learning best occurs and what is necessary and sufficient to create a learning environment that serves the individual child, the expectations of the community and the requirements of the state. Thoreau is the culmination of 50 years of scholarship and progressive practice, including leading both public and private schools. I'm not alone. Our team includes two PhDs, several MAs, and a collective of 300 years of teaching practice in progressive settings. The theme here is synergy. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Our program is unique, designed by a team of well-prepared experts in developmental models. We've studied Montessori, Waldorf, and Reggio. We've practiced in different cultural settings. We know the challenges that await our complex model and we have the expertise to meet them. Our synergy involves the Santa Barbara community in partnership to leave no child inside. The emergence of this group combined with Antioch's master's program in nature-based education again represents the whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. Thoreau Community School, the many letters of support from Santa Barbara organizations including both UCSB and Antioch, are more evidence of synergy. 
Other evidence of our gathering capacity is our relationship with Netzel Grigsby Associate, who generously volunteered their support to raise funds for our vision of schooling. Next slide, please. We are a unique school with a leadership team with a proven record of commitment and capacity. Our petition has been carefully reviewed by Procopio, by the CCSA, which is the California Charter School Association, and our consultant, Russ Altenberg, who are all cheering us on tonight and waiting to speak if you have questions. We are problem solvers and creative thinkers, and we work hard. We know there is a place for our school in Santa Barbara, and we're eager to defend our petition. Next slide, please. In the next few minutes, we will respond to the major concerns in the staff report. Next slide. Good evening. I'm Elizabeth Blair, founding member and acting educational director for Thoreau. As you know, the educational ecosystem of SBUSD is complex. There are grave disparities between academic outcomes for vulnerable student populations and their more privileged peers. A new centrally located downtown school would be able to serve such students. By focusing on the well being, strengths, and interests of all children, TCS will support them within our caring learning community, building their resilience, perseverance, and academic achievement. As you can see, the number of numbers of families with students who are meaningfully interested in our school continues to grow, tripling in the last month alone. In fact, since we created this presentation, our numbers have increased even more with a current total of 113 Santa Barbara Elementary Boundary students. Next slide, please. Since October, we have continued to work diligently to expand our efforts to reach our demographic goals. Admittedly, this has not been easy. We have established a focus group whose goal is to develop relationships with Latino families in the downtown area. After many formal and informal conversations, the feedback is clear. Families are interested in our model, but they say they need assurance. They need to know that we are an approved school. They need to know we have a location they can access. Because of the relationships we have built with a downtown, downtown location and bilingual staff, our recruitment efforts will produce a more diverse student population. Next slide, please. Our petition clearly states that to meet our enrollment goals, we will use a weighted lottery system should we be oversubscribed. The numerical points represent the weight given to each priority criteria. The students garnering the highest number of points will be the first to be offered a spot in TCS. This strategy supports a model called diverse by design. We will be intentionally diverse by design. Similarly, our petition and budget clearly define our goal of enrolling 60% or more students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch. As I have said, relationships, recruitment, and facilities are intricately intertwined. As you will hear next, all of our facilities' efforts focus on identifying a location that meets the needs of all of the families who will join our school. Next slide, please. Good evening. I am Lisa Kerwin, and I am here as an educator, parent to young children, and one of the founding members of Thoreau Community School. I am also part of the Facilities Advisory Committee for TCS. As you know, Thoreau's intent to locate the school in an area accessible to families in the lower east and west sides with access to outside space. Next slide, please. We currently have a letter of intent from La Casa de la Raza located at 601 East Montecito Street with the possibility of renting that location for the 2021-2022 school year and formalizing a contract once we have board approval. We are within our budget at the La Casa de la Raza site. Additionally, we are collaborating with Rhonda Henderson from the Radius Commercial Real Estate Group. While we've been exploring commercial sites, we are open to any possibilities and partnerships that the district may have, such as Parma School. 
We are continuing our investigations for appropriate locations and we are confident that we will find one. Next slide, please. We agree our unique educational model is firmly rooted in the California Common Core State Standards and Next Generation Science Standards. As an educational leader, I know that the key to meeting the needs of all students is hiring staff who have a solid understanding of these standards and how they progress. We have many teachers well-versed in these strategies who eagerly await the opportunity to join our team. In October, we submitted signatures of seven teachers who expressed interest. To date, we have 26 signed forms from a wide variety of teachers, including bilingual and those with special education credential requirements. Next slide, please. In the lesson plan template we provided in our written response, we will intentionally incorporate universal design, a research-based framework to improve and optimize teaching and learning. Additionally, the extensive instructional materials laid out in our proposal are grounded in offering responsive and highly differentiated learning for all students. Next slide, please. We know that reclassifying English learners as fluent English proficient through the RFEP process is critical to improve the social and academic outcomes for these students. To that end, Thoreau's educational leaders and staff will comply with all applicable state and federal laws in regard to services and the education of EL students, such as those listed here. Next slide, please. We chose to put the word community in our school name, knowing that community development and community engagement leads to improved student learning, stronger families and healthier, healthier communities. In addition to the examples here, Staff will be trained in adverse childhood experiences or ACEs to better understand how student learning and behavior may be impacted by trauma. Next slide, please. Without being able to join the Santa Barbara Cell Club, the district was correct in their concern about Thoreau being able to provide the full range of services for special ed. We clearly missed the deadline for joining the Santa Barbara County SELPA for 21-22. We reached out to other state SELPAs and we found the LA County Charter SELPA has flexible guidelines. We will be able to provide our special education services through LACCS. We ask the board to consider this solution. TCS will negotiate an MOU that substitutes budgeted Santa Barbara County SELPA fees for similar LA County charter SELPA fees. Our submitted budget for special education is approximately $100,000, including a half-time special education teacher, part-time counselor, and part-time paraprofessional. In addition to payroll taxes benefits for all positions, we budgeted $10,000 for outsourced special education consultants, including a provider like Mariposas Project Health. We have a commitment from Sylvia Wasjutin of MP Health to provide the range of services required. My name is Sylvia Wasjutin, founding director of MP Health. I am currently working with a thorough community school to provide all the necessary supports for their future special education program. My commitment to fully support TCS comes from all sides of my being. I am a bilingual speech pathologist that worked for the Santa Barbara School District and the County Education Office for more than 16 years. And over 10 years ago, I took a big step to create two agencies that embrace exactly the TCS educational philosophy of equity and diversity. MP Health serves children with varied developmental abilities and economic backgrounds through a child-centered nature-based program that celebrates uniqueness and active and equal participation of children, teachers, and parents. We successfully support the Adelante School with special education services that are unique for their dual immersion program. 
For the past 10 years, we have provided services to all children from the Santa Barbara, Goleta, and nearby school districts during the summer camp through our CENCAL sponsor, Summer Camp. Our agency has ties to over 10 universities, including NYU, USC, Dominican, Northridge, among others. To summarize, MP Health is wholeheartedly advocating and supporting this educational model, but more importantly, has the experience and the proven knowledge to best support TCS. Our very talented and diverse group of bilingual therapists will be ready to support the school with speech, occupational or physical therapy, counseling and full assessments. Thank you. Clearly, MP Health is aligned with TCS philosophy and inclusion practices. In addition to this solution, Thoreau will recruit dual credentialed faculty for full and part-time positions. These teachers will serve both mild, moderate, and moderate severe needs, special needs. Our intention to host teacher candidates from UCSB teacher education will include those earning special education credentials, adding support to our full-time faculty. We acknowledge the challenge with the SELPA in our petition. With board approval, we will work with the LA County Charter SELPA and MP Health to remedy this concern. Next slide, please. We submitted a viable budget in October with our petition. Our most current revised budget, an overview of which, of which we submitted to the board and staff today, continues to be viable. In year one, highlights include a net income of $97,000 and ending cash of $98,000. Additionally, Thoreau will apply for all CDE Public Charter Schools grants, including the $100,000 grant for the planning phase, which we will submit by the March deadline. CDE also offers a revolving loan up to $250,000 where funds dispersed in the fall and winter of the first year help with cash flow needs. Working closely with XED, a charter school back office promoter, provider with over 20 years of experience providing business management services to charter schools. We are ready. Next slide, please. Since October, when we submitted our petition, we have made significant strides towards readiness. We began humbly as a group of educators and have now branched out to include a robust group, including a more diverse board, a bilingual outreach coordinator, a realtor with a proven track record of successfully supporting community projects, an advisor who supports special ed students in Santa Barbara schools similar to Thoreau. Our next steps are clear. We are poised and ready to use our extensive networks to immediately identify an acting operational director, provide ample TCS board training, submit a startup grant request to the California Department of Education, for up to $575,000 and identify a downtime site to further build community relationships. In conclusion, we believe we are ready to partner with the district staff and board to meaningfully meet the CDE blueprint for great schools and the needs of Santa Barbara students. Before I thank you deeply for your consideration, I would like to ask that one of our partners, Chris from the Charter Schools Association, make final comments on our behalf. Thank you, Elizabeth, and good evening, Superintendent Maldonado and honorable board members. My name is Christopher, Chris Cobalillo. I'm a senior director of local advocacy at the California Charter Schools Association. Board members, you have a letter of advocacy on the Road Community Schools petition um, from our association, and I ask that you please take it into consideration. We at TCSA have worked with the petitioners and are confident in their capacity. Board members, charter authorization is tough and nuanced work, especially given recent revisions to charter law. And deciding whether to approve or deny a charter does mean embracing some level of uncertainty. But here's what we know. Charters that succeed don't necessarily have every detail spelled out in their petition at submission. And that makes sense. Rather than take the time and energy uh, to go through every potential contingency in a petition, great schools 
write petitions that give board members the details and confidence they need to authorize the petition, but then get on with the work of building their village. Successful teams do have a ton of capacity, pedagogical knowledge, a vision for success, the community interest to accomplish their goals. That's what you see in the Thoreau Community School team. Board members, you have examples of successful schools in Santa Barbara, charter schools as well. Schools where the school design is different and interesting and so much so that it might seem unconventional to even a trained eye. For instance, Peabody Charter School includes a less common form of teacher-driven governance and helps students meet state standards by numerous programmatic elements, including outdoor programming. While this district and existing charter petitioners are doing much excellent work, there still exists a community need that the right operator might fill as covered in Thoreau Community Schools petition. This is particularly evident in the student academic data and waitlist data of existing school options. Board members, I urge you to consider these factors uh, as you make a decision on this agenda item tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now, Ms. Trujillo, I believe that we have public comment on this action item also. Thank you, President Ford. Yes, we do have 12 uh, public comment on this item. I will name the first six speakers so they can get ready to speak. Uh, first, Celia Hernandez, Jenny Salinas, Gavin Jimerson, Delilah Santos, Ra Rochelle Bardmier, and Sybil Gilbertson. And I will begin with Celia Hernandez. And Ms. Hernandez is not online, so I will loop back to her. I will go with Jenny Salinas. Um, Ms. Salinas is also not online. Um, I will loop back um, and we'll have Gavin Jimerson. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, go ahead. Good evening board members. My name is Gavin Jimerson and I'm a junior at Dos Pueblos High School. I'm also the president of Tomorrow's Green, which is a youth led environmentally focused 501c3 registered nonprofit based here in Santa Barbara. We have hosted various tree plantings and beach cleanups, and our goal is to empower youth in order to address environmental issues. We are currently creating an environmental curriculum through which we hope to educate youth about the importance of the environment. You can find our website at tomorrowsgreen.com, which goes into further detail about our accomplishments and provides information about the organization. We learned about Throw Charter School through an article in The Independent, and we really liked the idea of having an environmentally focused charter school. After thoroughly reviewing the staff report on the petition, we understand that there are currently unresolved issues. That is why we have come here today to ask the board to neither approve nor deny the petitioners. We ask that the petitioners work closely with the SB Unified staff in order to develop plans for a charter school that will be successful. As our climate crisis continues to worsen, it is crucial that students have an environmentally focused education. Therefore, we support the goals of Thoreau to provide that environmentally focused education while still adhering to the state mandates. Thoreau would fill a need in the Santa Barbara community for a school that adopts environmentally focused values. We hope that the SB Unified staff and petitioners can come together to revise the plan in order to create a thriving environmentally focused charter school for the community. Thank you for considering our request and for your time this evening. Thank you. Next we have Delilah Santos. Hello board members. My name is Delilah Santos and I have two children that have IEPs attending school in the Santa Barbara district. When I heard of Thorough School and its principals, I autom automatically thought, wow, how awesome it would be to have my children learning outdoors, not only because of COVID, but it's a great way to build creativity and imagination and hands-on experience like the, like the Youth Wilderness Project. 
many children flourish in main, mainstream schools, but I believe in my heart that my children would benefit from Thoreau School and other parents feel the same. In the past, many great people and nations like the Aztec, Mayan, and Native Americans, like many others, would have elders and teachers teach them how to be involved with community and have respect and respect leaders and have self-confidence and have independence and simply be happy and safe. I have faith that my children will flourish and be successful in this alternative way of learning. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Rochelle Garnier. One moment. Ms. Garnier, can you hear us? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, hello board. Hi, my name is Rochelle Barnier. My husband and I have a four and a half year old daughter and a two and a half year old son. Our daughter will be of kindergarten age this fall, making her eligible to attend the row. My husband, Robert, and I are strong supporters of the row. Robert was born and raised in a village in Bosnia. He is a child of war over differences and differing beliefs. When the war came to his village, his childhood home was completely destroyed and he lost immediate family members, all in a war over unacceptance. The Thoreau program is so important to our family because they embody justice, equality, and diversity, embracing the core of what makes us each unique and important in this world. We are passionate about the Thoreau program because they encompass the development of learning and nature, just like Robert had while he was growing up in his village, but in a safe place so that our children, the children of our community grow and learn to be kind, responsible, collaborative members of our society. There's not anything more we could ask for in a program for our children other than Thoreau. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Sybil Gil Gilbertson. Hello. Good evening. My name is Sybil Gilbertson. I'm a mother of two incredible sons, long-term resident, involved parent, and professional. I'm currently an MFT trainee at the Community Counseling and Education Center. I'm a believer in and champion of the development of the whole person, the human potential in every being, and innate intelligence and creativity as a birthright. TCS would be an asset to our community for many reasons. While meeting state standards and assessing children from grade level readiness, TCS would do this in some non-traditional ways that promote justice, earth connection, inclusivity, and flexibility. These dynamic and shifting times deeply need young citizens to cultivate an embodied sense of confidence, connection, and community. It would benefit all if this was ingrained and activated early. Two things that make TCS stand out are multi-age classrooms and inquiry-based learning. Multi-age classrooms have been shown to promote caring environments where children learn from and take care of each other, where modeling and mentoring can be practiced and where real life is mirrored. Multi-age learning puts learning at the center, helping children develop socially, academically, and emotionally, as well as promoting a complex understanding of human relationships. TCS also promotes inquiry-based learning where the authentic interests of each child are woven into learning and curriculum. This is inherently a more collaborative model, supporting children early on to take charge of their life and take care of themselves and fellow humans. To quote my mother, a longtime educator and child advocate, it's not how smart you are, but how are you smart? When children are given a more dynamic, inclusive, and collaborative learning environment, I have no doubt that they're wisdom will be revealed and acts of guiding force will, will be with them through their journey. TCS meets a clear need. It is time to be smart, to trust our young ones, to listen to themselves, to empathize with others, and to be stewards of the earth we all call home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, again, I don't see Celia Hernandez and Jenny Salinas, but I will keep circling back to them. Our next six uh, speakers are Alice Post, Sheridan Rosenberg, Moni Duet, Toreida Morales, Jolanda Medina Garcia, and Shannon Stark. And we'll start with Alice Post.
Oh, Alice. Ms. Post, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hello, my name is Alice Post, and I have been an advocate for a downtown school for over 20 years. My mother was a teacher at Lincoln School, and my mother also taught at Wilson School. I was very excited when I heard that the Road Charter School wanted to be located downtown. Although I am a neighborhood school advocate, and in general, I would not be a big supporter of commuter schools, this one is different because they want to be downtown. There are so many children living downtown who cannot walk to school. So if they are located downtown, obviously that will be an opportunity for some number of children to walk to school who cannot walk to school at present. I would wish that it could be have an attendance boundary, but I found that it cannot. So I support them. I read their petition. I've met their people. Their t main teachers are amazing. The woman, um, Marianne, is amazing. The petition is very thorough. The school day looks amazing. I think that this is what all of our schools should be doing. And kind of strange bedfellows, but I strongly support thorough community school. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Sheridan Rosenberg. Hi, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to say that, you know, it's, it's no secret that our district has a lot of problems. However, the charter schools are the very best of what our district has to offer. We love our charter schools. In fact, our daughter attended Santa Barbara Charter School from first grade all the way through sixth grade, and it just saved her. It was the most loving, positive experience I could have imagined as a mother. And my daughter really thrived in that environment, especially in the multi-age classroom setting. The blended classrooms were a huge success, not just because children could really learn at their own pace, at their own level, but they created a bond with the teachers that went all the way through from, you know, for six years. And I just think this idea of the Thoreau School is brilliant. And we should do everything in our power to support them and help them with whatever they need to um, come up with an application that can be, you know, sort of brought to success. It's also a terrific use of the Casa de la Raza facility. It's not only a great location, but we all know that Casa de la Raza has been plagued with lots of problems. And I think this is such a win-win for the community and especially for the school district. And I really wanna add that I think one of the worst things that Kerry Matsuoka did while he was superintendent, and there are so many, I can't even count them, was to close the open alternative school. That was a terrible decision. Santa Barbara Charter School was almost closed. And in fact, I attended that board meeting. I think every parent from Santa Barbara Charter School was in the room. We had hundreds of people supporting our beloved school and the district really rose to the occasion and got with Santa Barbara Charter School and helped them with the application Fine. so they knew it. Um, anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Moni DeWitt. Yeah, good evening, Sandra and um, board. Um, I just can't tell you how excited I am about this school. I think this is exactly what Santa Barbara Unified School District needs and would be quite healing. Uh, for a very particular reason is that the students who are the most vulnerable and years behind our students with learning differences or English language learners and foster youth, as we know on our CAP scores, um, they are, you know, they have different learning styles. And for teachers of diverse learners, it's especially important to use a broader repertoire of strategies, which this school does provide. 
Um, you know, some kids are global thinkers, others are analytical, some learn best from lectures and reading, other from manipulatives and hand-on experience. Some children thrive on competition and some achieve more in a cooperative setting. And I can tell you that students with learning differences as I am one, and I've raised one successfully by going to Garden Street Academy, which had this very similar program. And the equity piece is that I was able to do that. Um, and that is partially because I am white. I have to say my privilege gave my son and I more choices. And the reason why my heart really sings when I hear about this school is because kids in our district who don't have privilege will have the opportunity to get exactly what my son got at Garden Street. And the way it's laid out, it does build community. Families are interwoven. And I couldn't agree more with Gavin in the beginning. You know, this group, I can see from everything I've talked to them, that they are trying to do it right. They're so innovative. They got LA to help them. And I think you need to work together. It would be such a demonstration of the board and community solving something rather than being adversarial. And the whole point is it would meet the needs of our students who are most vulnerable, whose learning style this needs because they need to learn in a different way. And it would just be exactly what we need. And it's hardly a risk at all. And it would be less expensive than I'm your PR firm or anything else. And it's about the kids. Please have courage. You can do this. Here's I'm, your moment. Thank you. thank you. Our next speaker is Shannon Stark. Hello, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak in support of the Thoreau Community School. Uh, I was a friend of mine reached out to me and knowing the challenges that I've had in the public school system. And um, when I read the core values and the petition for the Thoreau School, it literally brought me to tears. It encompassed everything that I believe in. I am um, a native of Santa Barbara. I was born and raised here and I also live downtown Santa Barbara area. I'm a single parent of a, of a nine year old child and I am in the housing community. So I'm a part of the um, mm -hmm. uh, Santa Barbara housing authority program. And so having a school like this downtown would be ideal for many of us. Um, I've spoken with neighbors who um, all have different ethnicities that are very intrigued by what this school offers. My background, I have a de um, degree in early childhood education as well as a degree from Antioch in environmental studies. My child also attended Star King Parent Child Workshop, which was an outdoor program. And I also worked at a preschool um, as a teacher for an outdoor program. I understand and I've studied the benefits of being in the outdoor environment and what it has done for my child personally. We've had some challenges in the public school system. So when I saw a school like this offering, you know, these opportunities for me and my child, I became immediately involved. What could I do? How could I help? And part of what I'm doing is putting the word out and sharing it with, um, you know, the diverse uh, communities that I'm a part of. Uh, I think the, the value system of the Thoreau Community School has not only their outdoor learning plan, they promote the community, they celebrate culture, diversity, and inclusion. These are all fundamental, important things for our children to learn. It is so vital for us to have an alternative option so that we don't feel like we have to fall into a public school category. I feel that my child would benefit from it. Thank you so much, and I um, support uh, the positive movement of this school. Thank you. Thank you. President Ford, we have four speakers that are not online. Um, again, I'm just going to say their name. Jenny Salinas, Gavin, um, Celia Hernandez, Doraida Morales, and Yolanda Medina Garcia. Um, and um, they're not online, so that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you very much, Ms. Trujillo, and thank you to all of our presenters and also to all of our comments from the public. It's at this time now that I open up the questions and comments to members of the board. And uh, so I look to my board member colleagues to ask questions or to give us some thought. I'd like to remind you that we have an opportunity to uh, do a number of 
to choose a number of different motions, one to approve, one to deny, or one to approve with conditions. Are there any comments from board members? Go ahead, Ms. Caps. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, yeah, I just thank you to all the speakers, both from here from the district and from Thoreau Community School uh, group. Um, it is clear how much community support you have. Thank you to all of the uh, folks who took time to write to us. I think President Ford said it was about 45. Um, we read them and it, you know, you brought forward so many good perspectives. Uh, one question I have to the Thoreau group is about the pandemic and outdoor education. I know that this has been in the works for a couple of years, and certainly um, according to Dr. Kasten since she was in sixth grade, but how has the interest from the community uh, been impacted by the pandemic and a belief that I certainly hold central that we should be doing more outdoor education uh, for years to come, given um, the fact that COVID is our reality. So I would just like, I'm just curious in terms of the uptick, if you see a correlation there with, um, with families and, and wanting to make sure that their children are outdoors as much as possible. If that's appropriate to ask. Yes, I'm great, sorry. thanks. I can't see my colleagues, but I'll go ahead and start and see if somebody wants to chime in. Um, I think that's a really good question. When, when COVID hit almost a year ago, we all kind of sang our blessings and a curse, knowing that this really would be our time. Um, but I think what we really have found is that the people who've been interested in our program and in, interested in outdoor education has stayed pretty steady and it hasn't increased drastically because of COVID. Rather, it just seems more apparent and more of a better opportunity for us. Thank you. And while you're um, speaking, um, if you could just, just articulate, obviously we wanna make sure that any school in this district is serving our emergent multilingual students. Can you articulate a bit more? I appreciated the, 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 the attention to your slide but the fact that our staff has concerns gives me concern. So if you could speak to more about, uh, unpack that for the board and for myself um, to tell us what the plan is currently and how you seek to improve it should this petition go forward because that is the utmost uh, importance. Thank you. Certainly, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, of course, if we're passionate about English learners, we have to have a solid plan. And my personal experience is working in Goleta School District as an educational leader and as an interim principal. So I'm very familiar with the English learner process, the reclassification process, making sure that we are following um, MTSS processes to identify special uh, English learners and um, using appropriate state adopted uh, curriculum to ensure that we meet their needs using both integrated ELD and designated ELT. Thank and you, I, I know that you've spent energy thus far in recruitment uh, from, from uh, Latinx community. Uh, I know that that's a, a strong emphasis going forward. Do you have any other, in addition to what's been done prior with the radio ads, et cetera, uh, I know that the, the COVID restrictions, limits, gatherings, and things like that, but do you have any um, plans should this move forward for, to increase that outreach? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, we don't want to say that COVID is an excuse, but it certainly does make things hard. And what we've learned through this process is that word of mouth is when we um, start hearing that more people are interested. And so to not be able to reach even the beginnings of some of the Latinx community that we want to reach, is making it very difficult to reach out. Um, we do have a founding group member who's on at Storytellers Preschool and she explicitly reports that she has families who are interested, but they're not ready to sign meaningfully interested forms until they have more certainty. Thank you, and I'm certainly impressed when I saw that you have Yolanda Medina 
Garcia from Star King on your board. She knows just about everybody in town. So uh, thank you for that. Those are my questions right now. I, I could reserve comment for the vote, President Ford. Thanks so much. Ms. Alvarez, please. Yes, uh, thank you. I Did I mute myself? Yes, I did. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to all the founders, the board members, and everyone ha who has put, I'm sure, hundreds and hundreds of hours to this, uh, to bring forward this petition. I want to assure you that I put in a lot of time myself this weekend and uh, a little bit before that reading your proposal and also reading the district's response to your proposal. I also had a very lovely conversation yesterday with Dr. Kasten and I have also had conversation with Ms. Chate and other cabinet members as well regarding my questions and my concerns. Uh, before I go, I, I move forward, or forward, I like to do a brief summary of the process and the funding structure of Santa Barbara Unified School District as a community funded school, and also its responsibilities if it was to approve this petition as the, uh, the oversight responsibilities and financial responsibilities for charter schools. And uh, what this means is that Santa Barbara Unified is a community funded district, just like all the other dis public school districts in Santa Barbara because of the property values. So the majority of our revenue comes from property taxes. A portion of the property taxes that are paid by landowners, by property owners goes to fund the school districts of their children's attendance area. The difference between uh, a, a non-charter school and a charter school is that the charter school has no attendance area. Uh, students from different attendance areas, even from a different town may attend the charter school. However, the authorizing district is still responsible to fund all of those students in the attendance area. So what does that mean for SB Unified? Uh, what does that mean to the fiscal impact? According to the projections that we received, uh, the fiscal impact for SB Unified could be ranging from year one of $900,000 to approximately $3 million in year three, four, or five. This means that uh, we, when we develop our budget, we have to make sure that we budget for this before we budget for other programs because we are the authorizing school. So that's, that's a summary because I did receive several questions about the funding. So that's why I'm, I'm commenting on this. On the other, on the other hand, uh, when districts that are not in the attendance area of SB Unified, when their students come to SB Unified authorized charter, then we pay for those students and that results in like a savings for other districts because as a community funded district, we're not funded based on enrollment. If we get more students, doesn't mean we get more funding. If we get less students, doesn't mean we get less funding. So that is uh, the possible fiscal impact to SB Unified. In addition to that, I looked at the budget that was submitted and I spent a lot of hours looking at it. I also went over it uh, with Dr. Kasten yesterday. In addition to that, I went to the experts. Uh, the experts are the Fiscal Crisis and Management Assistant Team, or what, we, what is called FICMAT. And they have a list of that's called indicators of risk or potential insolvency. So what I did is I compared the budget that has been submitted against that list uh, to help me, to inform me what should I be looking for. And some of the items that they say that to look for is number one, unreason unreasonable or unclear budget assumptions. Uh, number two, reliance on private revenues or donations. Uh, One-time sources utilized for ongoing expenditures. Uh, cash flow needs. So those are some examples of what we should be looking for as the fiscal oversight of a charter school. And I, I found all of those in the budget that was submitted. So I'm gonna give you a few examples of the concerns that I currently have based on the budget that is in front of me. 
And some of the some of the concerns I have is that the budget assumptions, both in expenditures and revenue, are not a fiscally sound plan. Uh, it is my professional opinion, and also based on what I read from FICMAT, that the reliance on private donations and loans doesn't result in a firm cash flow expectation. Uh, in addition to that, I read in the in the um, petition in the response to the to the district's concern that there will be temporary cash flow gaps. And those temporary cash flow gaps are projected to be covered by private donations, which concerns me because the expenditures have to be met every month. In addition to that, it's very important to note that an ending fund balance is not the same thing as cash on hand. And for example, in year one, uh, TCS is projecting that it will receive about $18,000 in lottery monies. However, even though re the revenue is recognized that first year is not actually received until the following year. So this is concerning for, to me. In addition to that, the interest for the loan appears to be low. If uh, TCS is projecting to take a loan of $350,000 of approximately 9% interest, what's in the budget seems to be pretty low. It, it's, it seems to me that it would be higher. So that's another concern that I have. The other concern that I have is the personnel costs. I'm not gonna talk about credentials. Dr. Becky already talked about that, but it seems to me that the salaries that are projected for the personnel that is projected to be hired are low. And uh, let me give you one example. One example is that this budget includes $1,485 for substitutes. If the school year will be 180, that means it's about $8.25 per day. That, that's low. And also it's not accounting for the statutory leave entitlements that employees have and they may be absent so that the charter would be required to hire a substitute. That, that's also concerning to me. In addition to that, it's having a five and a half hour custodian per day doesn't seem enough to me, especially now with the COVID-19 uh, cleaning and disinfecting protocols that we have to follow and the COVID-19 prevention program we would need more revenue to cover that expenditure. And of course, the special education expenditure was already mentioned by Ms. Jete, but that's in my projection was 175,000 and her projection was 165, so we're, we're fairly close. And then one thing that has not been mentioned that is extremely concerning to me is that of transportation. If um, the charter is projecting 60% of low income students, these students usually require a little bit more of support. If these students live in Goleta on the west side, how are they going to get to school? Uh, we would need to transport them. Parents, I, I don't think they're going to be able to take them to school every day and pick them up. Uh, for a Student Transportation of America, they charge about $100 per hour. So when we hire a bus for three hours, it's $200 a day. You multiply that by 180, it's another big expense. So those are fiscal concerns that I have in regards to the budget that was presented. And of course, I also have concern about the EML students that have already been discussed. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Alvarez. Uh, I understand that we do have one of our public speakers online now, so I'll turn this over to Ms. Trujillo before Ms. Munoz speaks. Thank you, President For Yes, we do have Yolanda Medina Garcia. And um, Ms. Garcia, can you hear us? Ms. Garcia, can you unmute yourself?
Good evening. Can you can you hear me? Yes. yes, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Maldonado, school board members and guests. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Yolanda Medina Garcia. I support the proposed the Rose Community School and currently serve on their board. <clears throat> I will address the outreach to the Latinx community. I'm glad I have this opportunity. Since the pandemic, reaching out has become more of a challenge in the last year. However, on February 11th, we offered an information Zoom session and had 43 participants. The session was scheduled for 30 minutes and it continued for 45 minutes with 38 of the participants in attendance. Questions included, where would the location be? Will children be required to wear masks? Will meals and after-school care be available? Um, some of the other outreach efforts have already been listed in the PowerPoint presentation, so I'd like to um, skip that. But I do want to emphasize the importance of word of mouth and that um, it's really critical that we think about accessibility for the Latinx community, both by um, informing and and including our uh, as far as education, informing our community and making accessibility um, uh, available. Uh, it is usually through word of mouth that people learn about schools. So I think it's important to emphasize the importance of retention of families. Keeping the families who have, brought into, who have been brought into the school uh, is most critical. Um, I think that with race relations and inclusion, um, as major issues in our society that must be addressed, this is the year to be intentional about our inclusive efforts. The biggest barrier for building trust and open communication is the language barrier. TCS has committed to hiring a bilingual administrative assistant and bilingual teachers. Spanish speaking parents will communicate more in their native language and therefore develop ownership and take on more responsibility and be more involved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, President, for that concludes public comment. Thank you, Mr. Hill. And now on to Ms. Munoz. Thank you, President Ford. I also would like to, you know, um, echo my sister board members, um, in particular, Ms. Alvarez, with her concerns about the budget for the, the charter school, which of course is of, you know, crucial importance to keep it not only this, you know, coming year, the first year, but in the next three, four to five years and so forth. So that I just really feel that it needs to be a sound budget, you know, that we should be seeing a sound budget. I understand it's been worked on for several years, you know, in terms of the, uh, the Rose School. I also have concerns about the children's being able to get to and from school. Um, I did spend time with, which I appreciated, with uh, Yolanda Medina Garcia, the board member who just spoke, and also with Elizabeth Blair and um, with an additional, um, with Gloria Liga. And I appreciated, you know, finding out about the, um, the teaching, you know, the Montessori, which I'm very familiar with, Waldorf, and I learned from them about the Reggio um, theory and such. I think that in terms of experience, and intentions, it, they're, you know, it's very good. They have much experience, you know, certainly um, Yolanda Medina Garcia, I know for, have known for years and years. Um, but I am concerned about the children being able to, ex, you know, get to and from the school, as I said. I mean, there's so many working parents, the um, Latino community, the parents are barely being able to get to work, you know, when they have um, two jobs with multiple children. And so I am concerned about, you know, the transportation needs and also the nutritional needs so that we are really looking at a school that will be able to sustain that. Um, that in addition to also is in reviewing the governance, the policy, you know, as, as the cabinet evaluated, I think is, is a valid concern, you know, that the board of directors, that that structure is clear and in place and um, that the bylaws are, are clearly spelled out. So I do have, you know, several concerns uh, about um, the school. Um, and I, one, of my, one of my questions is, you know, I understand we have three options um, 
approval, you know, denial and conditional approval. I would like to know a little bit about a little bit more, but you know, I don't know if it's fair to ask here about like if it was a conditional approval, what time frame we would be looking at. Mr. Tay, would you like to have um, our attorney explain that piece to us? She's online as a panelist. Yes, Sandra, if you could allow Suki Oali to come, come in to speak to that issue on the conditioning approval. I believe she is as a panelist already. Good evening, board members. Can you hear me? There she is. Okay. Yes. Good evening, board members. Uh, my name is Suki Oluwalia of Atkins and Andelson, Lawyer Root and Romo. I've been um, listening to the presentation and I'm happy to address board member Munoz's question. Um, as board president was indicating, you have three options tonight to approve, deny, or approve with conditions. The idea behind the approve with conditions is to give the opportunity to the petitioners to address some of the concerns that have been raised by the staff, specifically specifically in terms of budget, governance, um, employee qualifications, as you raised, um, you know, the free and reduced lunch, nutritional meals, et cetera. What that essentially provides, and we've prepared a resolution for you to use should you choose to go down that route. Um, and it essentially provides a window of opportunity for the petitioners to address those concerns. Should those concerns not be satisfactorily addressed to the satisfaction of the district superintendent or designee, then the approval is deemed to be denied and the, peti the petition is no longer valid. And if the board is inclined to go down the route of conditionally approving, my other recommendation would be for you to also consider the term of the charter for an initial charter. Uh, that's the one time that you have flexibility. So you can approve a charter term from anywhere up to five years. And in many instances, in my experience, when we've got a, a new charter and there's been a number of issues or concerns that have been identified by staff, um, it's our recommendation that you approve a three-year term because that gives the petitioners sufficient time to get quote up and running but then also gives um, the uh, district board the ability to monitor them on a closer basis because then they have to come back to you at the end of three years for a renewal. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Of course. Oh, thanks very much. Okay, it's my turn. <laughs> and I have to sort of give a, a disclaimer or I guess a, a caveat of sorts. The board and many members of the cabinet know my experience, but for members of the public, it's important for me to state that over a third of my career has been spent as, as a charter school leader. Um, and it may be important for you to know that 629,000 students attend charters in California, and that's about 10% of all public school students. And there are over 1300 charters in this state. And I know there are charters that haven't lived up to the promises that they have offered to their districts and their families, but that is not the case here in Santa Barbara. My experience with charters here has been absolutely wonderful. We have Adelante, we have Santa Barbara Charter School, as well as Peabody where I was the principal for five years. To me, charters represent a terrific potential to think outside of the box, to provide an educational experience that is non-traditional, to meet the needs of parents and students and students who are seeking something different, something exciting, and um, also just do in education in different creative, nimble ways, um, maybe even a li living laboratory setting. Um, so knowing this, I considered also this uh, charter application promoting Thoreau very carefully, as well as the district report. So here are a few of my reflections. Um, one is that I believe this team is qualified to run a charter and uh, their qualifications are listed in this petition. And there are quite a few other items in the petition that are supposedly missing. But moving on from that, I think this is a complex petition and it's a complex educational model. It's not uh, 
simplistic, and it's more thorough than many approved charters I've seen over the years. It's also innovative. Um, it has an out of the box way of educating students. And to me, it means that traditional means of assessing and judging it um, often fall short and don't seem to meet our needs. Um, I, and as noted by the district, that there is extensive pedagogical knowledge. And um, for that reason, I believe that this team can do it. Um, and it's not a reason for me to deny this charter. It just won't look like a typical school in any way. Uh, I, I believe they have the capacity. I'm not sure interviews were conducted with members of the uh, founding group, but um, I just want to clarify that concerns alone don't disqualify a charter for petition approval. But I do see some weaknesses that I think have to be addressed. Uh, they've got to identify and hire a, an experienced and knowledgeable director of operations. So nothing falls through the cracks. All legal requirements and deadlines are met and that diverse enrollment that reflects Santa Barbara Unified Student Body is achieved. I wouldn't approve a charter if it didn't. They must not only show aspirational um, kind of commitment, but evidence of engagement and partnership with the Latino community, no matter where their facility might ultimately be located. And other overall, I, they've got to really show us their um, an improvement in their recruitment efforts. And of course, it's very, very difficult during this pandemic. Um, and it's difficult actually anyway to recruit students to charter schools, as you can imagine, especially before a petition has been approved but this is a very difficult mountain to climb. And so in the end, I think it's a matter of trust based on what we know, do we trust that these leaders will meet the challenges, the easy fixes and the tough fixes? Um, I, I think that if the board is interested in improving Thoreau, that they should consider conditions. And I think we should also consider possibly a 22, 23 start, given that next week is March. So with that in mind, really, I wanna just again clarify the three options that we have, open to my uh, colleagues here on the board. And um, so I will ent entertain any kind of motion and any second to a motion and then any discussion and a vote. Ms. Caps. Thank you. I appreciate your experience, all of yours, and the conversation that we're having here tonight. Uh, and I, that's, you just articulated from your years of experience, what, what my gut reaction is as well. I so much, uh, I have to just say, when I received the report on Friday from our team, um, I was crestfallen. I've given support verbally to this project uh, since it was just an idea years ago. I've met with the team, I've provided, you know, I just answered questions as I would with any group, but I've, I, and I've just been on record as such a proponent of outdoor education. And we think about what's good for our students as our North Star. The more students, I believe, who are learning outside, outdoors from this wonderful environment that does enhance inherently equity. Nature does that for, for people, all people. And not to mention the, the creed of environmental sustainability. And then you add to it for me, uh, the safety that's involved with the more that we spend time, not in these four walls like we are tonight for several hours, uh, but getting our kids out, outdoors. So the fact that there is this option to approve with conditions is very appealing to me with total respect for staff. I, do, I know that that um, is probably a frustrating thing to hear. I do respect all the your expertise and the time, but I agree with President Ford. Ultimately, our job is a voice of the community and the community is so strongly supportive of this uh, endeavor, this project, this experiment. And like all things, it comes down to a bit of a leap of faith and I have faith and throw community school. And I want us to be partners to help it succeed. What that looks like exactly in terms of conditions, I'm open, but I'm hoping we can move forward. 
Thank you. So you're making a motion for condition, to approve any conditions? I, I yes, I think I, yes, I am making a motion to approve with conditions. I don't haven't quite settled. I would love input as to what they could be. Uh, I'm intrigued by the, the the your idea of a 22 start, which gives me pause. There is again the pandemic, and knowing that most of our education uh, will be with masks this fall, uh, probably next fall too, potentially. So, um, so I would. I'm open to what sort of those conditions would look like and actually honestly defer to you or other members of the board um, for those specifics. Board, board President Ford and um, Ms. Caps, uh, I'd like to ask Suki, we have some prepared language if there were, if you were to take that, but there is a whole resolution language that we would have to have in place to read and approve if that was the route you wanted to take. And I'd like to ask Suki if you could explain a little bit of the resolution aspect of that language. You need to unmute yourself, Suki. Okay, I'm here. So uh, thank you again. Let me talk about some of the conditions. So you have the resolution that we had drafted and obviously it's subject to revision based on some of the conditions that the board would want. We tried to make it somewhat general in nature so that essentially what it does is it provides the flexibility to the staff and the superintendent to work with the petitioners to address the concerns that were raised by staff as well as any concerns that have been raised by the board tonight. There were concerns uh, raised by board member Alvarez regarding the fiscal issues. There were board members raised by the board president regarding the start of the school year. So those are some of the things that we can work with the petitioners on. With respect to the specific start date issue, the petitioners can start as late as September 30th of this year and still be eligible to receive full funding. Alternatively, if the board desires for them to start in the 22-23 school year, that would be a condition that's placed in there and they would they would be a charter school so they could apply for funding and financing, et cetera, et cetera, but they wouldn't be eligible to start um, instruction. They could use that year as a planning and implementation year. Um, there's also other conditions that are in there about you know, hiring or job descriptions. Um, one of the concerns that was raised earlier appears to have been addressed um, in terms of the SELPA, but we would want them to provide evidence by a date certain of the membership in the SELPA. So, so those are that's how we've um, affixed it. So, but we would want the board to adopt this resolution so that in the event that those conditions are not satisfactorily met in the timeframe in which we've proposed them, then the petition would be deemed denied. Um, I think that at this juncture, everybody always has you know, good intentions and wants and, and believes that everything can be negotiated and many times it can be, but in the event that it can't for whatever reason, then there is an option, that, then the default I should say is denial. So let me clarify here though. So there is, um, there would be a motion to a approve with conditions as Ms. Cap suggested, and then a motion to approve the resolution? Or does so the resolution the, take the place of a motion? So the motion would be to conditionally approve the charter and adopt resolution number, and I, I forgive me, I'm forgetting the okay. number on it. Yeah, yes, so she has it in front of her. Yeah, and so the, res the, the resolution right now in its draft form has some, several conditions. If there are other conditions that the board wants, you know, we have we have the ability tonight to, to add to it um, and then we can have it ready and prepared for the board. And this one is if it's with Cambridge. That one's just- That's for five. That's all fine. So I've, I've just handed Ms. Ford the other resolution, which would uh, be a conditional with a three-year limit. Yes, so, there are so as I had mentioned earlier, yes, so as I had mentioned earlier, um, the board does have the discretion 
to grant a charter petition for less than five years. You have the authority to grant it from anywhere from one to five. We don't recommend one because that's just too short of a time frame. Um, five, especially with a school that might be struggling or might have some of the issues that are identified today, um, sometimes is a long term because they're not as accountable to you. A three-year term allows them some space to get up and running, but then you know, provides that they need to come back to you at year three. And at that year three, you can assess whether they in fact fulfill the promises that they said to you. Um, and if they did, great, then you can renew them. And if they didn't, then that's an opportunity to say, um, this is not a charter that should be renewed. If I can just speak in support of the three year. Um, I just heard tonight from uh, those involved with the school of a very, to me, a very sincere willingness to work with us and to improve. Uh, it came across loud and clear. It came across in their very thorough response to the staff report. But again, tonight in, in person, uh, I was hoping for that. And I, I certainly heard um, a willingness to be a strong partner with us rather than go their own way um, and dig in. They, they, they opened up. So I believe a three year time period is something I'm interested in in the motion. Okay, so in front of you, Ms. Caps, you have the three year, the resolution for three years. It's the second one that I delivered to you. So you would make a motion to approve the uh, charter petition with conditions and also approve the resolution and then the number of it, which is a three year term. Yes, with the, uh, what we're all experiencing when I put my glasses on and they fog up. I, uh, <laughs> yes, you said you, 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 as you stated, yes. Uh, can you actually read the resolution number? <laughs> or <laughs> am I asking? <laughs> you're, you're asking that. Let's see here. Okay, resolution number uh, 2021, 2020 slash 21 dash 25. Would you like me to read it, the title? Sure, the title, but not sure. the whole resolution. Okay, resolution of the Board of Education of the Santa Barbara Unified School District, conditionally approving the charter school petition for Thoreau Community School, and alternatively making written factual findings supporting denial and denying the Thoreau Community School Charter if conditions are not met. Thank you. Is there a second for this motion? I'll second it. Is there any discussion or questions from the board before we take a vote? Ms. Munoz, please. I would just like to say that I think that the, the intention is good. You know, I know that there has been much work put into this. Um, I'm sorry. Um, yes, but I, I do feel, you know, the responsibility to the school district as a whole and the input from the cabinet. So I'm. I just want to say that. Sure, you know, thank I, you. I appreciate the, you know, the Thoreau um, Community School and all of their founders. Yes, Ms. Albert. I appreciate the intent and the aspiration. I, looking at uh, the composition of the, <laughs> of the petition of achieving 60% low income, 13% special ed, which is very close to my heart and I approve. However, I don't see a full understanding of the fiscal resources that I needed to achieve this aspirational goal. And I, uh, at this point, I am not ready to support this petition that is being brought forward. Thank you. Sure. Any other comments? Ms. Caps, would you like to say anything else? No, I, I believe I said it, so thank you. Great. Uh, I, I do want to say that I think a three-year term is also very difficult. So if we were to vote this in, it's, it's tough to meet all of the requirements that a charter is promising to do in three years. So it really raises the bar on, uh, on the charter, um, which I do see that our, our group is very interested in doing. With that though, I, I think it's important uh, at this point to take the vote. So all in favor of the motion to approve the charter with conditions, 
And uh, this includes a three-year term. Please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. Aye. All opposed, please signify by raising your hand. Aye. So the vote is two, two. And I believe that that is effectively a denial. And what will happen now is that the, the founders of, of the Rogue Community uh, School will most likely take their petition to the county for uh, on appeal. Is that correct, Ms. Chete? What the next yeah, step would be? Suki can answer that. Okay. Um, hello again. Um, so yes, the 2-2 two -two means that the motion did not pass and the county will likely consider that to be a denial and the petitioners have the ability to appeal the denial first to the county office of education and thereafter to the state board of education if they so desire. Thank you very much. I think that concludes this item and thank you to everyone for their, their passion and their knowledge. It is, it is time for a break. We've been going three hours straight. Um, so please board members about seven minutes for a bio break, some fresh air and uh, just to regroup yourselves back here at 940 please. Thanks, it's 940 and we're returning back to the board meeting. We're uh, ready to go on to action item number two, which is the uh, approval to return to in-person learning for K-6. Uh, to introduce this item, I'll just turn this over to Superintendent Maldonado. Thank you, board president. And again, uh, board members, uh, as you've noticed, noted from our report, we are ready we believe we have all uh, checked off all our items so that we can safely return our K to six children, TK six to in-person instruction. We're recommending that we start Monday, March 1st and during the week of March 1st through the 5th, we will complete the return of all grades. Thank you. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Ms. Trujillo for public comment. Thank you, President Four. We have uh, Sophie Grace. Hi. Um, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very happy for the um, elementary students, and I'm happy that we're really starting to get back on track with opening things up. Um, I'm in seventh grade, and I'm really sick of Zoom. Uh, I spoke last time, but I didn't know if I could today. I was so pooped out for my Zoom classes that I felt like I couldn't do it anymore. Here's what happened today. We had a different schedule because of an hour long presentation about signs of suicide. The teacher shared their screen like always and told us to private chat them if we needed help or had any concerns about ourselves or our friends. The thing is, I can always tell if the teacher is reading a chat message, so it feels awfully not private. Then after that, we had more classes and lunch but I have Spanish class with eighth grade after that, and we had a class presentation. I wasn't sure if my group was quite ready, so I organized a practice session during lunch. Lunch is normally only 45 minutes long, and I spent 20 minutes of it on Zoom. Since Spanish started earlier than usual, I didn't want to miss any of my class, so I skipped my lunch. So during today, I only had a couple 10 minute breaks and no lunch. I stared at a computer screen until three. But this only represents one situation. In so many situations, teens are experiencing a life of all work and no fun or real social connection in online school. Social connections aren't just about teenagers having fun. They're about developing in an important way. And we've been almost fully deprived of that development for the last year. It seems like all the teachers and parents have very strong opinions on going back to school, but the kids don't really get much say and it is our school and our life. The few kids that I've talked to about it seem to have very pessimistic opinions and think we won't be back in school until next fall, but I'm hearing very different things here. A big part of junior high is becoming independent and creating your own friendships. Well, I haven't experienced that at all. It feels like all I've been learning about is the rock cycle and homework time management. So please give us teens some hope. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Wendy Aguilera.
And Ms. Aguilera, it's, it's not online. Just looking. Um, so present for that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you so much. Uh, since this is a uh, an action item, of course, I want to open this up again to board members for any comments or questions. I think Superintendent Maldonado and the executive cabinet have made themselves clear about what they are offering and, um, and what work they have done and the teachers' um, readiness for this. But board members, do you have comments or questions? All systems go. <laughs> then with that, I will ask for a motion, please. So moved. I move uh, to approve the recommendation for a return to elementary on campus March 1st. And I second. And there's a second from Ms. Alvarez. All in favor, raise your hands and signify by saying aye. 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 This motion to return to school in person in the elementary K through six is approved unanimously. Thank you, board members. Moving on to number three. Don't mean to rush you, but <laughs> <laughs> moving on. This is the approval of the CSEA proposal for the successor contract negotiations with Santa Barbara Unified School District. Dr. Becchio, please. Thank you very much. And having had a public hearing tonight on the CSEA's proposal for successor contract negotiations, I'm bringing this forward to you to the board to approve their proposal for negotiations. Thank you so much. Ms. Trujillo, are there any public comments on this item? No public comment on this item. Great. Then with these comments, is there a motion to approve the CSEA proposal for successor contract negotiations with Santa Barbara Unified School District? I shall move. Ms. Alvarez, thank you. And is there a second? Ms. Munoz, thank you so much for the second. All in favor, please raise your hand and signify by saying aye. 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 This motion passes unanimously. On to action item number four, which is the approval of modification to the memorandum of understanding between SBUSD and UCSB for the project entitled Validation of a Measure to Assess the Socioeconomic uh, e Emotional Health of Secondary Students. And I will ask Ms. W Dr. Wagonick to introduce G4, please. Thank you, good evening again, uh, President Ford, board and Superintendent Maldonado bring to you um, approval of this modification uh, for an MOU uh, for the project validation of a measure to assess the social emotional health of secondary students this is um, really, this is a very simple modification. It's simply to allow the district to provide the archival records that the uh, researcher is requesting. Um, what happened was um, because of COVID, we had made an arrangement to provide these, uh, this data in the fall, but in the meantime, the MOU ran out. So this is just extending the MOU for the purpose of allowing us to release um, those records as we had already promised. And I will um, take any questions that you might have. First of all, let's see if we have public comment. So, oh, wait a minute, I'm not sure my mic's on, is it? Yep. Uh, Ms. Trujillo, are there any public comments on this item? Thank you, Ms. Ford. We do have one public comment and it is Ms. Sheridan Rosenberg. Hi, thank you. Um, I actually have some questions about this. Uh, now, I I know you all are familiar with, you know, my very open disapproval of sharing information that belongs to students with these researchers. Um, I have a question. Is, you know, for the students who it says that it will be personally identifying information, is anyone being given informed consent? Do they even know that their information is being shared? I'm just curious, I don't have that information, but I'd, I'd really like to know. The second thing is, uh, is this, so um, giving this information over to, uh, to uh, Dr. Erin Dowdy, uh, is this to support a grant for her, monies going to her 
from the Department of Education. Is that why we're doing this? Um, and I just see a pattern, you know, I, I brought it up at the last meeting about Planned Parenthood collecting information. And what I see is that you've really opened the door to nonprofits, to academic institutions, to use our students' information to leverage for grants, for donations, and for monies that go to them. And I, I really have a problem with that. I think that's really unfair. And I just think it would be nice at least if, if Frank could answer that, the two questions I have. Thank you. Thank you, President. For that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you so much. So now board members, do you have any questions for Dr. Wagenick re, uh, regarding this request to approve the modification of the memo? Not for me. Seeing no questions, then I will call for a motion to approve this modification uh, to the memorandum of understanding between SBUSD and UCSB. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Caps. And is there a second? Second. Ms. Alvarez, thank you. So all in favor? of this motion to modify, raise your hand and signify by saying aye. 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 This motion passes Thank unanimously. You. So now we go back to the report section of our agenda and that leads us to number two, which is the pandemic learning recovery expanded summer learning report number two and we have a number of names associated with it. Uh, this is a report and discussion item. So I'll turn it over to members of the executive cabinet. All right. Uh, good evening, President Ford again, board members and Superintendent Maldonado. We're pleased to present you with an update on our planning for summer learning and our ongoing efforts to support our students and very specifically to address pandemic learning recovery. We're committed to ensuring a collaborative process that will allow us to get input from our stakeholders before our summer learning recovery plan is finalized for TK through 12th grade. We wanna be just sure to reiterate at the outset, thank you, that the, in this as in all efforts, we are guided by a student-centered learning approach that is focused on offering a multi-tiered system of supports cycle. What is it we want students to know? How to engage all our learners? How do we know students are learning and how do we respond to students' needs? Next slide. At our future meeting, we will be able to provide you with an update on our plans and development. And as you can see reflected in the phrase, February through May on this timeline, we will continue to engage stakeholders throughout the planning and development of our plans. So seeing as, as we're coming up on the end of February right now, we wanted to highlight those groups with whom we have already engaged to inform our planning. And that includes community organizations, including United Way and their summer programming, our teacher advisory task force. We looked at our student input that we garnered through the distance learning survey administered at the end of January. We consulted with our curriculum leadership team and with site administrators thus far. We also have plans to take several additional steps to expand our engagement, including but not limited to teacher and parent needs assessment surveys, our LCAP stakeholder engagement process, and our counselors in our secondary schools. In the develop phase, March through May, we plan to identify the needed courses and curriculum, plan for staffing needs, post positions and hire, and plan for operational considerations like transportation and meals. And of course, our implementation will occur during the summer months, primarily between June 14th and July 23rd. We envision that that uh, time span will involve several elements, a TK through 12 summer school, partnership with community organizations, and our partnership that, that we have come to know uh, between Santa Barbara City College and Peak uh, in the form of the College Bridge Program. But we also want to make sure that people know early on that we're interested to develop and implement additional bridge opportunities by adding specific sessions in August. So these are experiences that support students as they matriculate to a new grade level. Think sixth to seventh, eighth to ninth, or even seventh to eight for those students who may not get a chance to participate in in-person learning on their school campuses this spring. Um, Ms. Escobedo will take you through the next couple of slides. Thank you, Ms. Carey. 
So as uh, previously mentioned by Ms. Carey, we did engage in the Superintendent's Teacher Advisory Council on the subject of summer learning recovery. Teachers responded to two questions using Padlet, which allowed us to capture their input in general and with respect to the elementary and secondary grade spans more specifically. The two questions that they were asked, what do you identify as the key support students need for summer extended learning? And what supports do staff need in order to make it happen? Next slide, please. When we broke down that information by elementary and secondary, these were our results. And as you can see, first, I'd like to focus our attention on which supports were found in both the elementary and the secondary teachers' uh, responses and uh, were underscored as being important. SEL, or social emotional learning and mental wellness, and social connections for our students during that uh, summer support plan, meeting student needs for food and transportation, supporting attendance and engagement, supporting student transitions between grade levels and spans, trained staff, and small groups, which notably is seen as a desired support for both students and staff and which will support some of our other aims as well. I will now hand it back to Ms. Carey to talk about the secondary. So just as with elementary, we see elementary specific desires such as literacy and, and math development foundationally, kinder readiness. There are some uh, features of the input from our teacher advisory group that are specific to secondary. We see the reinforcement of the importance of personalizing the approach to learning recovery, both in terms of meeting students' social emotional needs as well as their academic needs. Secondary teachers recognize the responsibility to support credit recovery for high school students who received an F this year, but they also recommend that we serve students who want to upgrade the credit they did earn with a grade of D so they can become or remain A through G eligible for application to the UCCSU system. At the same time, teachers expressed a desire to have our summer learning opportunities and the resources that support them focused on discrete and even individualized skills and standards. Finally, teachers hope to see support for the time they will need to plan and prepare for delivering student learning recovery. And so in conclusion, thank you, Mr. Rouse. As we focus our efforts and resources on bringing students back to school in person, we will prioritize the following both in the remainder of the school year, but also into and beyond the summer. And that is continuing to focus on, identify and focus on students with the greatest need, continuing to get input from teachers, parents, and students in some cases on an ongoing basis, continuing to both identify our program content, but also to refine it in ways that are responsive to student needs, and ensuring, as we heard um, from the board last time, that all of our educational opportunities are engaging and innovative, that that's extremely important, especially following the experiences of this year, as we've just heard from our student speaker tonight. And at this point, Ms. Escobedo and I are here to answer any questions that you might have at this time. Uh, thank you very much. Ms. Trujillo, do we have a public comment on this item? Yes, President, for we have two um, public comment requests and I'll start. Alice Post and Moni Duet. And I will start, oops, one moment. Lost my screen. I'll start with Alice Post. Hello? Yes, you may begin. I wanna, this is Alice Post. I want to congratulate the board on moving so quickly to institute a summer school to help remediate for the loss of learning that has taken place during the pandemic. The pandemic obviously is going to have a permanent impact on so many children who have lost so many months of learning in the remote setting that has not been a good educational outcome for so many. 
And if they fall in a year behind or a half a year behind, the best possible thing you can do is summer school. And I really hope that you will do it for at least the next three or three to five years, because these children are going to be behind and, and we want them to get back up. I, I love the individualized approach and also targeting what areas do they really need to learn? What did they not learn? So I was amazed at how fast you pulled it together and just really excited that you showed the leadership to do something to mitigate the terrible effects of this pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Moni Duet. Yeah, hi board, thanks for your patience. And um, yeah, this is something that I am concerned about is the learning loss, but even before the learning loss, again, the group of um, students with learning differences are English language learners, and sadly our foster youth were severely behind with a negative 113 for those with learning differences and about 89 for our foster youth. So um, I, I guess what I really want us to do or consider is make some systemic changes. And we could have less people in, in such a bad way by just automatic testing in our um, K through three intensive interventions for so, those that need and want it. And maybe, you know, so many kids now we could add it nature based and make it, you know, um, more sensitive to less screen time. And, um, and the last one is we really should consider evidence-based and, and not use balanced literacy because it doesn't work for this group. And this would be such an opportunity and it would really bring down the numbers and the need that the district currently has. And it's even worse. This learning loss thing is gonna make it even worse, but still fundamentally we need systemic change. And the three things I outlined come from Dr. Sally Shaywitz, who speaks to Congress regularly. She's like renowned. And, um, and so many people agree that this is the path. And I think our district really needs to address its literacy issue. Thank you. Thank you. And President Ford, that concludes public comment. I appreciate that, um, Ms. Trujillo, thank you. Uh, now board members, any questions or comments from you about this, um, this item, the, it's referred to as the Pandemic, Pandemic Learning Recovery. Recovery Program and Plans. Ms. Alvarez, please. Two questions. I'm, I'm sure that cabinet's already working on this. Um, being that summer's going to be here before we know it, I'm sure Dr. Becky is already recruiting for summer to make sure that we have personnel. And also, are we going? To, we are going to have food services during summer, correct? And what about transportation? Yes. Yes. And also, a communication plan early to parents to let them know this is happening. Also in Spanish as well. Um, and then a quick question. Maybe I missed this, so I'm sorry. It's kind of late. But we're having for six to seven, eight to nine. And did you, Ms. Carey, did you mention that seven to eight since they missed the beginning of school? And what about nine to 10? Did you also say that? And what about K to one? Maybe you said all this and I missed it. Yes? <laughs> no, thank you for the question. Um, I did mention six to seven and eight to nine. Those have been spaces where we've had traditionally had bridge programs. Um, but we also recognize that this year we might want to expand that given the experience of yes. this year. And so that's why I named seven to eight as an example. Uh, there could be others, um, but we're really thinking particularly with the bridge that may occur in August about um, both an opportunity to potentially proactively identify any gaps in learning, but also to acculturate students to their new schools, um, especially when there's a shift in the grade span. It's a big transition to go from elementary grades to secondary grades. Um, and I'll, I'll defer to Ms. Escobedo for the question about kinder and first. I meant the current kindergartners, uh, but they're going to school next week. So maybe maybe this doesn't apply. So. Yeah. So thank that you. that is correct. Uh, board member Alvarez, uh, a big a lot of thinking has gone in in that that particular age group because they have not, most of them have not been on campus 
uh, which is uh, why they will have some time to to not not too much, but just some time to to be able to uh, kind of get familiarized themselves with just their physical environment and also routines and and you know all the things that come with going physically back to school. So that's the plan. Oh, thank you. And I know uh, board member Ford mentioned this at the last meeting, something, maybe something fun for them also. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, other board member questions? Ms. Munoz, please. Yeah, mine's more just more of a comment that I appreciate, you know, the support for our teachers um, in terms of the summer school and they've had, you know, of course, a, um, a difficult year. So I appreciate, you know, the support for our teachers and trying to think of creative ways to, to help them so that, um, our students will continue to learn during the summer. And of course, they um, very much interested in support for high school students um, who, you know, can, um, is it credit recovery, I think you called it and stuff. So yeah, so very supportive of that. Thank you to both of you. Thank you so much. I don't have any questions. I'm delighted, excited that we're doing this. I think it's absolutely essential. And I love that, um, as a number of folks have already pointed out that you're so far along in the planning and you're philosophically uh, just absolutely determined to make this work for the students. I would say that, um, you know, not only do I hope that it's project-based and activity oriented and fun for the kids, but I think it's also important just to think about the words that we use. Recovery, it sort of even gives the impression that something was lost Learning loss is a term that we're hearing all the time. I think we should remember that these students are survivors. They survived this pandemic. And um, so if we can kind of just give this, um, give this whole program this feeling of this boost up, this, um, this uh, way of elevating the students who have survived a very, very difficult time, I think that it will change the way in some ways that we look at this too if that makes sense. So with that, I think we'll move. Uh, do you have a yeah, final yeah. comment, Ms. Smolder? Thank you. If I may just follow up a little bit on what you're saying, Board President Ford. Um, I want to remind us that there were many times in education where we thought we couldn't get technology off the ground for all our children, or that we couldn't use technology as teachers because we needed time to learn. And this year we have learned that all those things that we thought would take more time can actually be done a lot quicker. So if there's any good lessons learned from this pandemic, uh, for me they are that we can move faster. We thought we couldn't get teachers trained quickly or the teachers wouldn't be able to adapt. And we have learned in this pandemic that they can and that they do and that they do a great job at it. And so I just wanna make sure that we are not going back to the way business as usual used to be. So even as we think about summer learning and thinking about integrating subject areas, looking at the ways that art, music, and physical education are great ways for us to engage in language development for our EMLs, thinking about the way science and math intersect, the way we can read and write about the world around us, and the way that we can still continue to integrate technology because we are dealing with 21st century learners are all the lessons that I want us to keep and move forward. So as we hear from the public, from our teachers, from our parents with concerns, I wanna encourage us to not think of the way that we used to be or to think about going back to business as before. I really would like to take this opportunity to mark for all of us how far we have come along and how far we can go forward. So as I work with our cabinet, I know that I've been pushing them a lot. I wanna acknowledge how tired and how great they have been too at helping us. But at the same time, I think this is the moment for us to really move forward in education and, and deliver, deliver a, a different, different kind of program, program for everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. I think that's, those are such powerful words. And, <laughs> and let's remember that that does involve getting them outside. Um, I'm on the education committee of the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. And there are many programs that will help uh, students understand our coastal community on our environment and please call on me to to help you navigate that if um, 
if you're interested in getting them active outside this summer. So that takes us to board um, agenda item J, which is the coming events. So board members, if you take a look at it, you can review them, probably you already did. Are there any other items you'd like to add to this list of events? Seeing none, we'll go to item K, which is future agenda items. And I just want to again thank Ms. Maldonado and Ms. Trujillo for continually updating this list of agenda items. And um, Ms. Maldonado, on March 9th, can we add to the board study session secondary? Yes. Uh, a, a kind of a report and discussion about secondary returning to in-person. Absolutely. Okay, we great. We'll bring you an update for case rates and where we are with that plan. Thank you. And board members, how about you? Any other suggested future agenda items you've been thinking about, dreaming about, wishing for, hoping for? Okay, then um, I would say that um, on board agenda item L, the next meeting, I wanna clarify that unless there are some, any unforeseen circumstances, the next two board meetings will be held in person for the board with public part participation on Zoom on March 9th, and then following up with our regular board meeting on the 16th, the 9th, 9th being a board study session on, on, um, on assessment and grading and also now secondary in person. So as uh, we adjourn tonight, I, I just want to thank everyone who worked so hard to ensure that this board had the information and the best thinking and the heart and soul that we needed to make some important decisions and thank the community, especially for understanding our need to build consensus despite diverse and often opposing points of view. Um, we've tried very hard to above all follow the data and the evidence. And even when a board vote is divided like it was tonight. It should signal to us and to the community that different points of views and perspectives are accepted and are valid. So thank you to everyone who persevered with us um, on our first sort of hybrid board meeting. Um, <laughs> we established social distancing by asking the board of uh, the public to join us through Zoom for our meeting. And it doesn't go unnoticed though, that when we hold a meeting on Zoom, we have hundreds of people attend. Today, we, we had 500 people during much of the meeting. So with that, I guess I would just say, I hope everyone will please, as we've echoed many ways and, and many times, stay safe, be positive, never lose hope, and good evening. The meeting of the Santa Barbara School Board is adjourned.